Sen Gupta. There you are. <laughs> Good morning, my lady. I appear on behalf of the Frontline Migrant Health Workers Group, together with my learned friend Piers Marquis, together with Annabel Timmon and Jesse Smith, we are instructed by Paul Heron, Helen Mowat, and Juliet Galley Glenny of the Public Interest Law Centre. As your ladyship knows, the Frontline Migrant Health Workers Group is comprised of the United Voices of the World, UVW, the Independent Workers' Union of Great Britain, IWGB, and Kanlungan, a consortium of Filipino and Southeast Asian community organisations. As your ladyship also knows, our clients' members are outsourced non-clinical workers, largely from ethnic minority and migrant backgrounds, and clinical nursing and healthcare assistance staff, all of whom were from a migrant background. We have framed our oral submissions by reference to Boris Johnson's slogan, also mentioned by Ms Carey in opening yesterday, and well known to us all. Stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Stay at home. Of course, my lady, our clients' members could not simply stay at home. They were key workers who were working at the front line of the UK healthcare system during the pandemic. As nurses, healthcare assistants, hospital cleaners, security guards, porters, caterers, couriers and delivery drivers transporting medical samples, and taxi drivers transporting other healthcare workers. Even when these workers became unwell and should have self-isolated, they could not afford to stay at home, whether financially or because of the risk to their jobs or both. And for migrant workers, there was the additional risk to their immigration status, which was dependent on their continued employment. Outsourced workers only had recourse to entirely inadequate statutory sick pay of £94.25 per week. Any migrant staff who were directly employed by the NHS, but exceeded their entitlement to occupational sick pay, for example in the event of long COVID, were not entitled to statutory sick pay. Because it was a condition of their visas that they have no recourse to public funds. Many frontline health workers who were staying at home because they were self-isolating were pressured to return to work too quickly rather than stay at home. Their vulnerable financial and immigration status often forced them to do so. So stay at home was not practical for our clients' members. Protect the NHS, of course a very laudable aim, one in respect of which our clients' members were and remain strongly in favour. As your ladyship has reported in module one, austerity policies had left the NHS with severe staff shortages and infrastructure that was not fit for purpose. The NHS's ability to respond to the pandemic had been constrained by its funding. Many of Kanlungan's members are nurses from the Philippines. They had come to the UK pre-pandemic in order to bolster the workforce of the NHS and thus help protect the NHS. Yet their sacrifices were entirely ignored by the government's hostile environment immigration policy. During the pandemic, the message was that members of the public could help protect the NHS by staying home. But what about those outsourced workers who were on the front line of the UK healthcare system, but not employed by the NHS? They were inherently vulnerable, both because of the nature of their occupations and the absence of the protection of employment status. The evidence disclosed suggests they were entirely overlooked. They certainly were not protected. For example, they weren't provided with PPE. Our clients, UVW, IWGB and Kanlungan, 
sourced their own PPE for their members. They weren't prioritised for vaccination. Even those members of our clients who were directly employed by the NHS were not adequately protected. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on ethnic minority, migrant and precariously employed staff was apparent to government from the early stages of the pandemic. Yet there appears to have been little, if any, action taken to protect them. The disclosure to this inquiry suggests that there was no consideration of them at all. Further, rather than being protected, migrant workers were disproportionately allocated to higher risk working environments than non-migrant workers. Their vulnerable migrate, migrant status meant they felt unable to complain or sometimes were threatened not to do so. As to knowledge, on the 28th of April 2020, the British Medical Association attended Downing Street, raising the disproportionate rate of serious illnesses and deaths in ethnic minority practitioners, suggesting that all ethnic minority practitioners be issued with FFP3 masks, and pointing out that because the majority of doctors who had died were migrant, there was a concern that they were being pressured into more frontline work. Further, on 3rd July 2020, the Independent Sage Group submitted a report to government. That report identified the occupations which had increased risk of exposure, infection and death, including the occupations of many of our clients' members. The report raised concerns that some of these occupations have been the last to receive supplies of PPE, that racial inequalities had led to ethnic minority healthcare workers having difficulty acquiring PPE, the higher mortality rates in ethnic minority health workers, and that mortality rates in deprived areas were twice that of the least deprived. The report noted how critical SSP was to ensure self-isolation and shielding the vulnerable. It was too low for working families to live on, and many low zero-hours workers and migrants were not eligible for it. It appears that nothing was done about these significant issues by those in power. <coughs> the government's final report on progress to address COVID inequalities, published on 3rd December 2021, exactly 17 months after the Independent Sage report, wrongly suggested that the government had only recently, now, become aware of the main factors behind the high risk of COVID-19 infection for ethnic minority groups. The evidence disclosed suggests that was simply not the case. Save lives. Our clients' members were working tirelessly to save the lives of patients, yet their own lives were being put at risk by the wholesale failures of the Johnson government during the pandemic. In the first 20 months of the pandemic, up to 22nd April 2020, 83% of the ethnic minority health workers who died from COVID-19 were migrant workers. 53% of the total UK healthcare workers who died were migrants. Further, as reported by Professor Cook, despite comprising only 3.8% of the nursing workforce, in the first months of the pandemic up to May 2020, Filipino nurses accounted for 22% of NHS nurse staff deaths. Milady, these are shocking statistics, and we say we're avoidable. Milady, our clients and their members are relying on your Ladyship's report and recommendations to change the future of the healthcare system in the UK for the benefit of healthcare workers and the public. History must not be allowed to repeat itself. The 40 years of failure of successive governments, so aptly described by Professor Lister, must be reversed. Your Ladyship's report will assist the new government and indeed future governments
to make meaningful changes to the UK healthcare system. First, by identifying the failures leading up to and made during the pandemic by government. Second, by asking why these categories of worker were so comprehensively ignored and exposed during the pandemic. And then third, identifying changes to ensure that the UK healthcare system is resilient in the face of a future pandemic. A workforce as important as the frontline migrant health workers should never be left unprotected again. Milady, those are our submissions. Thank you very much, Ms. Sengupta. Uh, Mr. Henderson. Uh, my lady, uh, good morning. My name is Alistair Henderson. Uh, I was the chief executive of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges throughout the relevant period, and I make this opening statement on behalf of the Academy and its 23 member organisations. The Academy is the membership body for royal colleges and faculties across the UK. We speak uh, for members on generic issues relating to healthcare quality, standards and medical education. We do not speak on specialty specific issues which remain the responsibility of individual medical colleges or faculties. I would like to focus our on our proposed 11 recommendations rather than the more generic and retrospective content of our submission. These recommendations have all been agreed by our members and are drawn from their direct experience during the pandemic. Some of the recommendations relate to long-standing and deep-seated problems that were there before the pandemic, others to specific actions taken during the pandemic. It is worth saying that our experience working at national level was that decisions were mostly based on the best understanding of the issues at the time and were made in good faith. That does not mean they were all always turned out to be right or that we can't learn from them. We believe that implementing these recommendations would have a positive impact for the delivery of healthcare across the four nations and help ensure that we are better prepared for to meet the challenges of any future pandemic. Thus, they would be of direct benefit to patients and the public. The Academy's proposals for your considerations are, firstly, capacity. We've heard this before. There has been inadequate workforce capacity across specialties and professions in the NHS for a long time, for a long time before the pandemic. It is essential that there is sufficient capacity in terms of both workforce and bed numbers in the system to be able to manage future pandemics. Secondly, in testing, there must be a clear national strategy setting out the purpose, benefits and limitations and delivery of testing. Third, professional involvement in planning. There should be greater involvement of professional clinical bodies in pandemic planning and running of scenarios. Fourthly, availability of personal protective equipment, as we've heard a lot about so far. Stocks of PPE must be sufficient and available at the right time and in the right place, with clear agreement and consistent messaging relating to what is appropriate equipment and usage. Next, returning and additional staff. Clear arrangements for rapidly bringing extra staff back into the NHS or being redeployed need to be drawn up and cover their recruitment, induction and deployment. An NHS reservists scheme may be a solution. Sixth, care homes. Whilst not our primary area of knowledge, there needs to be a full review of plans for supporting care homes in a pandemic. Next, mental health consequences. There should be proactive consideration and planning for the mental health consequences of any pandemic or indeed sort of disasters. Next was some more general points in terms of communications. There were many examples of good local communications and lots of national messaging was clear. 
but there were also too many examples of confused and sometimes contradictory messages at national level. <coughs> Nine, political consistency. Beyond healthcare, consistency in the political approach between different administrations is crucial. Different messaging and approaches across the four nations caused difficulties for the public and for healthcare professionals, and at times it seemed they were differences for difference sake. Consistency of clinical advice. There also needs to be consistency applied to clinical advice and guidance. Professional bodies have a responsibility to, uh, for any guidance and advice they produce to follow and align with accepted nationally agreed guidance, or where there is genuine difference of clinical opinion, which is obviously um, uh, uh, fine. This must be evidence-based and clearly set out and explained. And finally, transparency and honesty. Crucially, transparency, honesty and engagement must be at the heart of any government management of future pandemics. That did not always appear to us to be the case during the pandemic. And any erosion of trust will always have a negative impact and negative consequences. Finally, slightly separately, we would urge the inquiry to emphasise the importance of protecting and maintaining clinical education and training for healthcare staff during a pandemic, both for the future of the health service itself, relying on a pipeline of future staff, and for the careers of individual clinicians. Our written statement and written opening statement provide more detail on these recommendations, and we hope the inquiry will find these useful. We look forward to your ladyship's recommendations, and we're confident that if implemented, these will improve the state of healthcare across the system to the benefit of public, patients, and health and care staff. Thank you very much, my lady. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Very helpful. Uh, Ms. Clark, am I going to see you? Oh, I can see you. <laughs> It's, yeah, you're not on microphone at the moment. Keep pressing buttons. Thank you. Um, Milady, I appear on behalf of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine and the Association of Anaesthetists, along with Samantha Lee King's Council. We would like to start by thanking the inquiry for its diligent work to date and for offering us the opportunity to provide evidence. But we would also like to say that our thoughts are with all of those impacted by COVID-19 those who died, their loved ones, those who suffer from long COVID, and everyone whose lives were affected, disrupted, or even torn apart by the pandemic. Our organizations um, represent over 24,000 clinicians, many of whom worked on the front line during the pandemic. These include anaesthetists, intensive care doctors, anesthesia associates, advanced critical care practitioners, and critical care pharmacists. Our three organisations all function as representative professional bodies, but the faculty and the Royal College also set the curricula and exams for relevant postgraduate medical training. We hope to provide the inquiry with valuable evidence about the conditions under which our members delivered care, but also to explain how our organisations undertook proactive leadership roles during the pandemic. This included providing clinical expertise to policymakers, advising the government, educating the public, and signposting and interpreting official NHS guidance. We hope that our evidence informs not only the inquiry's findings generally, but more importantly, any recommendations it makes on how to prepare for a future crisis. We have also provided a more detailed written opening, but we wish to reiterate some of the most important messages to us here. First of all, intensive care. One of the key stories we wish to tell is that of intensive care. Intensive care units, ICUs, are where the most critically ill patients are treated and supported in hospital. ICUs are fitted with specialised equipment to closely monitor patients, maintain vital bodily functions and provide treatment for failing organs. During the pandemic, almost 50,000 of the very sickest COVID-19 patients were treated in ICUs. Unfortunately, even before the pandemic, 
ICUs in the UK were perilously under-resourced in terms of funding, staffing, bed capacity, infrastructure and equipment. In order to maintain safe and efficient patient care, the highest recommended fill rate of intensive care beds is 85%. Prior to the pandemic, this level had almost been reached in Scotland and it had been surpassed in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. There are different estimates of ICU beds per capita, but they all come to similar conclusions. In 2020, the OECD estimated that England had 10.5 ICU beds per 100,000 population, which was lower than the OECD average of 12. It was also substantially lower with, than France, the US and Germany with 33.9. Prior to 2020, lack of ICU capacity was already leading to cancelled operations and reduced quality of care, with potentially negative impacts for patient safety. 40% of units had to close one or more beds on a weekly basis due to lack of staff. To cope with demand, 80% of units reported transferring patients between hospitals. When the pandemic hit, there was a need to dramatically scale up intensive care capacity, and this was achieved, but only at huge cost to the well-being of staff, the education of doctors in training, and to other hospital areas which needed to scale back, or in some cases, stop their activity. In a survey of intensivists in November 2020, 80% of respondents reported increasing their working hours during the first wave, and 88% reported leave cancellation. There was also redeployment of other staff, such as anaesthetists, away from areas like elective surgery to intensive care. In a survey of anaesthetists, 43% reported being redeployed during the first wave. In order to scale up, intensive care took over other hospital areas, such as wards and operating theatres, which highlighted the existing constraints in hospital infrastructure in the UK. It also used supplies from those areas, such as ventilators and drugs, which led to shortages for other surgery, elective surgery. Most operations require an anaesthetist in order to take place, but even before the pandemic, the UK was approximately 1,400 anaesthetists short. This already constrained the NHS's ability to perform surgery, but redeployments made this much worse. Anaesthetists were also hindered by PPE shortages. In April 2020, almost one in five reported they were unable to access the PPE they needed. In some areas, measures to conserve PPE were used. For example, actions were bundled up so that one person wearing PPE could perform multiple tasks. This led to long periods in PPE and fewer breaks. Testing for COVID-19 was vital for hospital functioning. However, in April 2020, nearly 40% of anaesthetists were unable to access the testing they needed. And furthermore, self-isolation due to limited testing availability meant that the workforce was sometimes unnecessarily restricted at a time of high demand. Those reasons and more contributed to why surgical activity dropped by 54% between January 2020 and January 2021. This is equivalent to 9,770 operations being lost per day. In England, waiting lists were already large and growing prior to the pandemic, reaching 4.24 million beforehand. However, during the pandemic, they grew further and faster, reaching 6.7 million by its end. These are, of course, not just statistics. Real people are behind every story. And huge numbers of people continue to suffer, wait, and in some cases deteriorate, while the hospitals that were there to treat them were focused on pandemic efforts. Doctors in training. The experience of doctors in training deserves particular mention because doctors in training provide vital clinical service to the NHS, while balancing the need to reach important educational milestones. This balance was hindered by the demands of the pandemic working and dramatic changes to the types of cases being addressed. Exams also were disrupted or even cancelled, leading to difficulty with training progression. Anaesthetists and training were particularly affected, with 89% reporting that training opportunities had been affected and 76% said that they had lost out on clinical learning. Intensivists in training suffered from reduced clinical exposure to conditions other than COVID-19 and many took on additional work um, and unsocial shifts. All of this may have impacted on exam performance, given the anomalously low exam scores in October 2021. 
mental health and well-being. It is clear that the stresses of the pandemic impacted on mental health. The percentage of ICU staff reporting probable mental health disorders increased from 51% prior to the 2020 to 21 winter surge to 64% during it. The Royal College survey from April 2020 showed that over 40% of respondents suffered mental distress due to the stresses of the pandemic, while over a third felt physically unwell. By July 2020, those reporting mental distress rose to 64%. Communication with patients and their loved ones during this time was particularly difficult to manage, witness and experience. This also had an impact on the health and well-being of staff. Recommendations. Overall, we believe the lessons of the pandemic need to be learned and channeled into better preparation. However, in many respects, we are no better prepared now than we were in 2020. We argue that intensive care capacity should be viewed as a national resource. Improving that capacity would provide much more resilience in the event of a crisis, and it requires investment in staff, beds, infrastructure, PPE and equipment. Staffing deserves particular mention. The situation in intensive care has not improved. For example, the numbers of doctors able to enter intensive care training remains relatively unchanged. In anaesthesia, the situation is now worse than on the eve of the pandemic, and the shortfall has grown from 1,400 to 1,900. Unless action is taken, it seems inevitable that we will repeat the experience of the last pandemic. In any future pandemic, understaffed ICUs will need rapid expansion. Staff, including anaesthetists, will need to be redeployed. Surgical activity will decrease or stop. Patients waiting for operations will suffer. And we will let be left with another huge backlog on top of the existing one. Staffing needs attention now, especially because of the large and growing bottlenecks in the medical training system. Last year in England, 20,000 doctors in training who had finished foundation training applied for just 8,000 speciality training posts, leaving 12,000 unable to progress. When the NHS has such huge doctor shortages, this situation is intolerable and action to address it is urgently needed. And finally, we would like to finish by restating our thanks to all of those involved, re-emphasising the sacrifices and contribution of our members and reiterating that our thoughts and condolences are to all victims, their families and their loved ones. Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Ms Clark. Mr Stanton. Thank you, the opening statement of the BMA is as follows. The pandemic has had an enormous and in some cases devastating impact on those working in health services, on patients and on the healthcare systems themselves. Behind every statistic is a human story and a deeply personal experience, such as the following account from a doctor working in England who told the BMA, horrified to find myself caring for friends and colleagues on ITU. I'm tired of being the last person to ever speak to people before I anesthetize, intubate, and ventilate them, and for them then to die. Tired of passing last words between husbands and wives, parents and children. There is no escape from it. I see dead colleagues in the Trust News emails, local and national press. I dream about it intermittently at night. I'm intermittently consumed by the ocean of sadness it has caused. My lady, we know that experiences such as these will be at the forefront of your mind during this module as will the need to consider what more could and should have been done to mitigate these impacts. The BMA believes that while a pandemic or health emergency is always likely to put enormous strain on healthcare systems and the people who work within them, the extent of the impact was not inevitable. The impacts on staff and patients were made worse by the fact that healthcare systems entered the pandemic significantly under-resourced. And then, once COVID-19 arrived, decision makers failed to protect staff from harm. The UK entered the pandemic with too few doctors, hospital beds, critical care beds, alongside high staff vacancy rates, growing waiting lists, unfit estates, 
large maintenance backlogs and substandard IT infrastructure. This exacerbated the severe disruption to healthcare during the pandemic and necessitated unprecedented large-scale measures to ensure there are enough staff to maintain critical care capacity. The consequences of entering the, pa the pandemic significantly under-resourced and of the se severe disruption that followed are still impacting healthcare systems today with millions on waiting lists for treatment. Regarding the protection of healthcare workers, the nature of their work means they are more likely to be exposed to infectious diseases and as such, it is vital that adequate protections are put in place. However, at every turn during the pandemic, healthcare workers were not protected from harm. Staggeringly, over four in five respondents to a BMA survey said that they did not feel fully protected during the first wave. The supply of PPE was woefully inadequate. And during the early months of the pandemic, PPE shortages meant that staff had to go without PPE, reuse single-use items, use items that were out of date with multiple expiry stickers visibly layered on top of each other, or use homemade and donated items. In addition to these severe shortages, the inadequacies of the IPC guidance meant that any items that staff did have often failed to provide adequate protection from an airborne virus. Although the understanding of the significance of aerosol transmission evolved during the pandemic, it was well known at the start of the pandemic that there was the potential for aerosol spread. It was also known that respiratory protective equipment, such as FFP3 respirators, provided far greater protection against an airborne virus, virus than a fluid-resistant surgical mask. Based on these two pieces of knowledge, the IPC guidance should have taken a precautionary approach to protecting the lives of staff and patients by recommending that all staff working with COVID-19 patients use FFP3 respirators <coughs> to protect them from infection. Shockingly, despite the growing weight of evidence of aerosol transmission as the pandemic progressed, the IPC guidance continued to put staff and patients at risk of infection and of spreading that infection by recommending surgical masks for routine care of patients with COVID-19. And implementing effective infection control measures was made even more challenging due to poor ventilation in some buildings and a lack of space to separate COVID from non-COVID patients. It is the BMA's view that lives could have been saved if those responsible for producing the IPC guidance, as well as Britain's national regulator for workplace health and safety, the Health and Safety Executive, had taken a precautionary approach to protecting healthcare workers and patients. It is vital for this module of the inquiry to examine the actions of these bodies, including the extent to which considerations of cost and supply were elevated above safety. The impact of COVID-19 was not experienced equally, and it brutally exposed the fault lines of inequality which already existed. Inequalities manifested in a multitude of ways for both staff and patients, including along the lines of disability, ethnicity, and gender. This had consequences for infection, mortality, mental health, working lives, and so much more. For staff, there were inevitable, um, uh, sorry, for staff, there were inequitable experiences relating to feeling protected, having access to adequate and well-fitting PPE, confidence in risk assessments, and feeling able to speak out or raise safety concerns. To give just one example, the Health Service Journal estimates that over 60% of NHS staff who died in the first month of the pandemic were from ethnic minority backgrounds. In the words of a consultant working in England, we had no choice but to work in an environment which we knew to be unsafe. Headlines of health worker deaths and the ethnic risk factors and age made me look at my department and wonder which of us may not be here. Every colleague of mine extended their life insurance. We received the bare minimum protection. For many staff, the experience of providing care during the pandemic 
came at a great personal cost to their mental health. Their accounts describe experiences of trauma, grief, exhaustion, burnout, chronic stress, anxiety, and fear. Similarly, long COVID has severely impacted the lives of staff and patients, leaving them unable to work, train, and undertake day-to-day -day activities. In the words of a resident doctor working in Scotland, I caught COVID in March 2020 from a colleague at work. I have been mostly bedbound since. My life as I knew it has ended. These are supposed to be the best years of my life, but I'm spending them alone, in bed, feeling like I'm dying almost all the time. And the impacts of the pandemic did not simply end when restrictions were lifted. The repercussions continue today, with a recent survey by NHS Charities Together finding that over three in four NHS staff are currently struggling with their mental health. In addition, the failure to adequately invest in the UK's health services prior to the pandemic meant that staff were unable to provide the level of care they wanted, leading in some cases to moral distress and injury with devastating consequences for patients, the long-term impacts of which are still being experienced. The scale of this disruption was unprecedented in the history of the NHS, and the BMA argues that it, could, that it would have been less severe if the UK had entered the pandemic better resourced. As is made clear in the, in the inquiry's module one report, the question is not if another pandemic occurs, but when. As with COVID-19, healthcare staff and systems will be at the forefront of any future pandemic response, and they need to be in a, in a significantly better position to cope when this occurs. The preventable failures that led to harrowing experiences for staff and patients cannot be allowed to happen again. To prevent this, it will be important for recommendations to be made in the following areas. First, recommendations that will lead to better resourced healthcare systems with sufficient capacity for both day-to-day -day and emergency situations and which support staff physical and mental health. Second, recommendations that lead to better protection of healthcare staff in all settings. This includes a precautionary approach to staff protection, as well as ensuring that where unequal impacts exist, these are swiftly identified and mitigated. Third, recommendations that will address health inequalities and improve population health, which will improve the UK's resilience to a future health emergency and help to reduce the impact on health services. Ultimately, as highlighted in the inquiry's module one report, unless lessons are learned and fundamental changes implemented, the effort and cost of the COVID-19 pandemic will have been in vain. And for healthcare staff and patients across all nations of the UK, this has already been monumentally high. Thank you, my lady. Thank you very much, Mr. Stanton. Mr. Domingo. Thank you, my lady. This is the opening statement on behalf of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. COVID-19 highlighted the essential work of pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists, pharmacy technician, and wider pharmacy teams in supporting the nation's health. Pharmacists faced unparalleled challenges that stretched personal and professional resi resilience, a huge surge in demand from patients, and an unprecedented and changing working environment. The Royal Pharmaceutical Society is a professional body for pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists in Great Britain. Its members work across all care settings, including community pharmacy, hospitals, primary care, and the pharmaceutical industry. The RPS leads and supports the development of the pharmacy profession, and its mission is to put pharmacy at the forefront of healthcare. The RPS recognises that there were some successes during the pandemic, including the crucial role of pharmacy teams in maintaining access to essential medicines and supporting the rollout of COVID-19 vaccinations. But there were also significant failures and challenges that need to be examined so that vital lessons can be learned and the UK is better placed to respond to future healthcare crises. This statement highlights five key areas of particular importance to the RPS. The first is safety at work for pharmacists. 
The RPS asked the inquiry to consider the failure to protect healthcare workers and pharmacy teams, including through appropriate use of risk assessments and the provision of suitable PPE, and to examine whether IPC guidance and rules on testing, contact tracing and self-isolation were appropriate for all healthcare settings, including pharmacies. Pharmacists and wider pharmacy teams played an essential role in combating COVID-19, often putting themselves at risk so they could continue looking after patients in a time of national crisis. In the early weeks of the pandemic, many members of the public showing symptoms of COVID continued attending community pharmacies and hospitals. Guidance from the International Pharmaceutical Federation said it was reasonable to recommend that pharmacy staff wear a face mask to protect themselves from infection. However, national guidance on PPE failed to reflect the circumstances and environments in which pharmacists and their teams were working. It became clear that the majority of frontline pharmacy teams struggled to source PPE to protect themselves, their patients and their families, and that they were unable to maintain safe social distancing while at work. Community pharmacy teams were on the front line of COVID-19, but often felt last in line for support. For example, they were not el initially eligible to access a new government PPE portal, which enabled GPs and small care homes to register for protective equipment. Community pharmacies only became eligible to order from the portal on the 3rd of August 2020, when the first wave of the pandemic was over. The RPS England chair commented at the time, Pharmacies are one of the last places keeping their doors open to the public without an appointment, and yet seemingly an afterthought when it comes to sourcing PPE for staff. People working on the front line of COVID-19 should get the same support wherever they may be, including across the whole of primary care. The inquiry is well aware of evidence relating to the serious impact of the pandemic on ethnic minority communities. <coughs> and as Council to the Inquiry referred yesterday, an RPS survey from June 2020 showed that more than two-thirds of pharmacists and pre-registration pharmacists from ethnic minority backgrounds working across primary and secondary care did not have access to a COVID-19 risk assessment nearly two months after the NHS said that they should take place. The second key area is the health and well-being of pharmacists. The RPS welcomes the focus within the Module 3 list of issues on the impact of the pandemic on the physical health and well-being and the mental health and emotional well-being of healthcare staff. There is significant concern around the health and well-being of pharmacists and their teams. Before the pandemic, pharmacists had been warning that rising pressures at work were affecting their health and well-being. The pandemic placed enormous strain on staff and RPS workforce surveys demonstrate that many pharmacists are now suffering from burnout and from long COVID. As the pandemic progressed, pharmacy teams also reported an increase in abuse and hostility from some members of the public. <coughs> One RPS member in Wales described the massive impact on mental health, increased pressure of work, medicines shortages, and trying to keep your family safe. A community pharmacist in England described how Patients were understandably anxious and fearful of the situation at the time. And unfortunately, as front frontline healthcare workers easily accessible to the public, we received both verbal and physical abuse. In my pharmacy in particular, we also faced racial abuse. The third key issue relates to the work of hospital pharmacists, which is often less visible Yet over the period of the pandemic, hospital pharmacists cared for the most critically ill patients with COVID-19, transforming their services and ways of working and supporting the supply of medicines for critical care. Pharmacists also played a key role in rapidly establishing the Nightingale hospitals, building pharmacy departments in under two weeks to procure, store and supply critical medicines. Pharmacists in different healthcare settings have described the isolation they and colleagues felt as the pandemic progressed. Increased pressures due to staff shortages from illness, self-isolation or annual leave, and the impact of a rapidly changing landscape of advice, policy and protocols. One critical care pharmacist in Wales described how the limited availability of PPE resulted in me being the only member of the pharmacy team 
allowed to work on the COVID critical care unit, supporting essential medicine supply and helping to minimise infection risk. I faced stigma by peers within the department who did not feel I should be allowed in the department after visiting the COVID wards. I felt isolated at times. The fourth issue relates to the repeated and systemic difference in treatment between pharmacists who provided NHS contracted services compared with healthcare workers directly employed by the NHS. The disparity in treatment was seen in the exclusion of pharmacists from visa extensions provided to other healthcare workers in March 2020. In the absence of specific mention of pharmacists in guidance regarding key workers, which impacted childcare provision at school hubs, and significantly in the initial exclusion of pharmacists from the life assurance scheme covering frontline health and care workers in England. Despite their crucial role providing care throughout the pandemic, the pharmacy profession and particularly community pharmacy was often an afterthought in government planning, guidance and communications. This has had a hugely detrimental impact on morale and well-being within the profession. The RPS remains concerned that the failure to properly recognise the work of pharmacists persists, and it welcomed the inclusion of community pharmacy in the inquiry's list of issues. COVID-19 showed that community pharmacies were an essential provider of primary care in a time of crisis, and it is crucial that pharmacy teams are adequately prepared and supported in future. The RPS encourages the inquiry in Module 3 to examine and recognise the key role played by pharmacists in hospital settings, in the community, and across the health service in the pandemic response. Finally, resilience. And the inquiry is asked to consider the resilience of frontline workers and workforce capacity in the event of a future pandemic, the resilience of pharmacy services across all care settings, and the resilience of the medicine supply chain and medicines production. During the pandemic, pharmacy teams went above and beyond to support patient care but despite their pivotal role, community pharmacies are under continued pressure and strain, which is leading to closures and reduced patient access to care. The pandemic exposed the complexity and fragility of medicine supply chains, leading to shortages of many commonly used medicines as well as those used in critical care. Pharmacists have described the moral distress resulting from times when treatments would be available for specific patients one day and then restricted the next. In the years since the pandemic, it has become increasingly common to see medicine shortages. Aseptic pharmacy services, which provide sterile environments for the preparation of injectable medicines, played a crucial role during the pandemic, although a government report has warned that this response was very much an extremist and would be unsustainable long term without further investment. It is vital that medicines production facilities are included in considering resilience and preparedness for a future pandemic. The RPS submits that lessons learned must include longer term reforms to better manage demand and build resilience across the health service. Pharmacists and their teams and all healthcare workers must be able to work in a safe environment and be protected, particularly in times of public health emergencies. Thank you, my lady. Thank you very much, Mr. Lingo. Mr. John Charles. Thank you, my lady, and good morning. The National Pharmacy Association, the NPA, is a not for profit membership body which represents the vast majority of independent commun community pharmacies in the UK from regional chains to single-handed independent pharmacies. These submissions highlight three principal issues that the MPA asks you to consider during the Module 3 hearings. The first issue is the central role community pharmacy plays in local communities in maintaining good health and tackling health inequalities across the UK. Community pharmacists went to great, indeed heroic, length to ensure that services were maintained during the pandemic and really demonstrating the value of the network of community pharmacies across the country. Community pharmacies are part of primary care with a unique understanding of the health needs of the populations and the communities they serve. They are disproportionately located in areas of higher deprivation 
delivering health services in communities that need them most, and they play a crucial role in reducing health inequalities. A local pharmacy is one of the few places where patients can walk in off the street and access health care advice and treatment without an appointment. While community pharmacy is well known as a dispenser of medicines, its role is actually much broader and includes other NHS and public health services. For example, the provision of health advice, the administering of millions of flu vaccines every winter, and health checks such as uh, blood pressure. Pharmacies are highly accessible and provide a resource that is always available to respond to emerging health threats at pace. The core role played by community pharmacy during the pandemic provided crucial support and resilience in maintaining access to healthcare services, and they became the first port of call for many patients, with MPA members experiencing a substantial increase in the number of patients seeking advice for more serious health conditions. NPA members also reported a significant increase in the number of prescriptions dispensed from February to March 2020, and phone calls to pharmacies more than tripled during that period. Home deliveries of medication to vulnerable patients more than doubled, and many pharmacies experienced long queues outside their doors. Pharmacists and their teams worked tirelessly to maintain service provision and ensure the supply of medicine to their local populations. Many Medicines became difficult to source and expensive as demand outstripped supply and staff spent long hours sourcing medicines. Two quotes from NPA members illustrate the reality of the situation. A member from Cardiff said, I don't know how my staff made it through the period as they were working so hard for extended periods. They were up there with the doctors and nurses as the frontline heroes of the crisis. They were working under very difficult conditions, tired to the point of exhaustion, scared about their own chances of becoming infected. Yet, they came in every day because they cared about their patients. An Ilford member said, I've been a community pharmacist for 35 years now, but in the last four months, I think I've seen the most intense, stressful times that I've ever experienced. But at the same time, I have seen some of the most uplift uplifting stuff that I could ever imagine. On top of all this, community pharmacy then went on to deliver some 40 million uh, COVID vaccinations. The increased demand on community pharmacy during the pandemic had a significant impact on pharmacists and their teams, resulting in stress, fatigue and mental health issues for many NPA members. Milady, the NPA asks that the contribution of community pharmacy, together with other primary care providers to healthcare, is given careful consideration by the inquiry during the Module 3 hearings, so that proper account can be taken of these positive contributions. Given the essential nature of their frontline role, the inquiry is also asked to consider whether there was an insufficient investment by government in the network and the infrastructure needed to integrate community pharmacy into the broader health system and to support effective cooperation across the health service. The second uh, issue is that community pharmacy was often overlooked and under-recognised. Despite the central role played by community pharmacy in delivery of health care throughout the pandemic, community pharmacists and their teams were not given comparable treatment to other frontline health care workers, which meant that they often did not receive the support that they needed. The most significant and demoralising example of this different treatment by government was flagged so eloquently by a Council to Inquiry, Jacqueline Cleary, in her opening statement yesterday, and was the initial uh, exclusion of pharmacy workers from the life assurance scheme for frontline workers in England, despite them being part of the NHS primary care, risking their lives uh, to treat pa patients, and dealing with a huge surge in demand and increase in working hours. The MPA asks the inquiry to fully exa examine the circumstances that gave rise to this remarkable omission. Another example relates to PPE, which was not initially available to community pharmacy throughout the the NHS required many pharmacy teams to source and fund their own PPE. Pharmacies were unable to access the NHS PPE portal to order PPE until August 2020, some months into the pandemic. The supply of PPE was a challenge, and pharmacy teams put themselves at risk to help patients stay well, often working in close proximity to others and reusing uh, PPE repeatedly for days or even weeks.
Another reflection from an MPA member in Streatham indicates the challenge is faced. They said, very early on, we realised that risks staff were carrying was quite significant. When patients came in, they would congregate around the till. So we introduced a one-in, one-out policy to maintain social distancing. We also put up signs telling people not to enter if they have symptoms. We had no access, no access to PPE, but we were very fortunate that we have dentists as patients who had stock of their own to give us. It was also the case at the start of the pandemic that many people who worked in community pharmacy were not recognised as key workers, which would allow their children to attend school while, while they worked, notwithstanding that they were working in the frontline healthcare environment. Nor was COVID-19 testing initially available for community pharmacy staff. And community pharmacy was initially categorised as a retail setting as opposed to a healthcare establishment, which meant that entire teams needed to self-isolate following a single positive case within the pharmacy. This resulted in fewer available staff and increased pressure on remaining pharmacists and pharmacy teams. The MPA suggests that the inquiry examines whether the government properly and fairly considered the circumstances of all healthcare workers who contributed to the pandemic response. Thirdly and finally, the inquiry is asked to consider the resilience of the independent community pharmacy sector in responding to a future pandemic. Community pharmacy entered the pandemic facing financial and workforce crisis due to long-term underinvestment in the network. This presented significant challenges for community pharmacy in responding to the pandemic and increased the difficulties in providing services to patients and maintaining staffing levels. Underinvestment leading to threats to the network is something that persists to this day. However, despite these challenges, community pharmacies showed real resilience and commitment during the pandemic, as the, the following quote from a community pharmacist in Chesterfield demonstrates. He said this, my wife and I are co-owners of a single independent pharmacy. We are both pharmacists. When the pandemic hit, it occurred to us that if one of the team became ill or got COVID, there was the potential for the whole team to go down, and that would mean closure, leaving patients without medication, putting them in turmoil. Our big fear was letting people down. The solution we came up with kept us running and safe. So to split the team in half, my wife led one half of the team while the other half of the team isolated at home. Which, whichever one of myself or my wife was working stayed in the hotel for that week. At the end of the week, when I was working, I checked I was symptom free before going home. Even then, the family would go to a separate room and I'd go straight to have a shower and put my clothes in a bag. Only then would I come down to the family. We'd spend a day together, then we'd swap. We did that for 10 weeks. In 23 years in pharmacy, this has been the most challenging time of my career, but it's also been the most rewarding as well. We've not let our patients down, we've come through it. My lady, a strong community pharmacy network is an, an essential element of healthcare services in the UK, and the NPA invites the inquiry to consider the role and resilience of community pharmacy in responding to a future pandemic. Those are my submissions. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. John Charles. Uh, right, we'll do Ms. Morris and Mr. Jacobs, and then we'll take a break. Ms. Morris. Lady, I represent the Royal College of Nursing. The Royal College of Nursing is the representative voice of nursing across the four nations of the UK. It's a registered trade union, uh, and it has uh, over half a million registered nurses, student nurses, midwives, nursing support workers, and healthcare associates as its members. They work across NHS hospitals, specialist health facilities, in care and nursing homes, in the community, and in the independent healthcare sector. At the outset, the Royal College of Nursing wishes to offer its condolences and heartfelt thoughts to everyone who lost loved ones in the pandemic. It will never forget the sacrifice of healthcare professionals, including those who passed away as a result of the pandemic, and those who continue to feel the impacts on their health as a consequence of COVID-19. The College is committed to continuing to advocate for and support those of its members who were so affected by the pandemic. Uh, in these submissions, I will first briefly paint a picture of some aspects of nurses' lives during the pandemic and then focus uh, upon the issues of safe staffing levels, adequate PPE 
particularly in the light of the fact that this was a, a virus transmitted uh, by air, and finally the impact of long COVID on nurses' lives. Turning then to uh, how nurses coped with the pandemic, they played a central role in healthcare services, uh, and consideration of the impact on them will necessarily be at the heart of this module. They were affected in terms of the work that they had to do day in, day out, the support that was available to them or not available to facilitate that work, and the toll that the work took on their mental and physical health. Many nurses continued their professional commitment despite particular risks to them as they were pregnant themselves or clinically vulnerable. The impact on nursing staff included suffering from COVID-19 themselves, often on multiple occasions. It's well known that nursing staff carried a heavy burden in the COVID-19 pandemic, and the community responded to this global healthcare crisis in extraordinary ways, coming out of retirement, putting aside their studies, and being redeployed to new areas. Throughout the pandemic, the Royal College of Nursing engaged with its members through its existing interactive support services via a call centre and an online platform. Uh, through that, it received more than 28,000 contacts from members on issues that they faced during the pandemic. From these contacts, uh, uh, we can see what was experienced contemporaneously uh, and what was reported including attending work despite not being well enough to perform their duties, being asked to work in unsafe conditions, isolating themselves from their families in order to protect them, spending extended periods uh, when PPE was available in PPE that caused damage to them, contributed to their fatigue and stress, feeling depressed, anxious and stressed, experiencing symptoms indicative of PTSD. Alongside these difficult experiences, nurses were confronted with professional dilemmas, such as whether or not to treat patients without wearing appropriate PPE, how to delegate tasks when there were insufficient staff available, whether to undertake work at a higher level than they were familiar with, and ensuring that they balanced the unpaid overtime that they worked with considerations of patient safety so that their own overwork and exhaustion did not present a risk to others. Nursing staff from ethnic minority groups suffered poorer outcomes exacerbated by existing structural inequalities and institutional bias. Nursing students particularly suffered um, uh, with difficulties in terms of meeting academic deadlines, uh, uh, undertaking clinical placements, uh, and uh, uh, being excluded from uh, matters such as sick pay and indemnity and life assurance. Pregnant members and those on maternity leave raised queries about their rights and obligations in relation to attending work in high-risk areas, and those already with children experienced significant childcare difficulties. Members contacted and continue to contact the college in large numbers with queries about long COVID. Although the exact figures are not known, the prevalence of long COVID among staff working in healthcare is significantly higher than the wider population. Many nurses who contracted long COVID via exposure at work have either lost or now at risk of losing their employment due to their ongoing health issues and the lack of workplace support to enable them to remain in employment. Evidence shared with the inquiry from the college's members highlights the feelings of fear, panic and dread and their sense of vulnerability, as well as the emotional and physical toll of dealing with death, pain and suffering daily at levels they had never experienced before. Turning then to the issue of safe staffing. Crucially, the size and characteristics of the healthcare nursing workforce across all sectors was inadequate to meet the demand for care and service delivery. And it continues to be so. For many years, 
the College had been advocating for the government and devolved administrations to take urgent action to fill vacancies, retain existing staff and bring new entrants into the nursing workforce. Too few nurses have studied at university and joined the profession, too many have left, and of the colleagues that remain, they feel overstretched and undervalued. The College considers that a workforce crisis was well entrenched in the health and care service before the pandemic struck, and it significantly impacted the ability of the UK to appropriately prepare for the impact the pandemic would have. It shone a spotlight on the critical role undertaken by nurses across the UK, and nurses uh, continue to feel overstretched and undervalued. However, during the pandemic, policymakers in the UK government hid behind a narrative that the pandemic was to blame for the ongoing collapse of the healthcare system, refusing to acknowledge the extent of the workforce shortage until June 23. This failure in accountability and transparency further damaged an already depleted system and workforce, and the effects of this cannot be remedied quickly enough to ensure patient safety and to meet the expectations of the UK public. PPE and RPE. Without adequate PPE and RPE, RPE and training in its use, nurses and midwifery staff put their own lives, the lives of their families and their patients at risk. These supplies should have been modelled on HSE recommendations uh, and the adoption of a precautionary approach to the protection of healthcare workers. The level and quality of supply should not have been dictated by cost, opinion or confusion over non-UK adopted frameworks such as the hierarchy of controls. The pandemic stock levels were vastly underestimated, uh, as was uh, the extent of global demand. It's the view of the College that a lack of clarity on use of the term PPE, combined with a culture of assumptions that historical influenza guidance and views on its transmission and impact in the 21st century was inadequate. It placed healthcare workers at unacceptable risk when faced with a novel pathogen. Challenge, challenges around distribution, the inequality in supply, uh, and other services were among the main issues. Due to those challenges, there were reports that college members had been required to reuse single-use equipment, use equipment previously marked as out of date, clean used gowns with alcohol wipes, and to use alternative equipment which had been donated and which did not meet adequate standards. So while public donations were signals of support, they did not replace the legal responsibility of the system leaders and governments to ensure that correct PPE was provided. The College received reports of members wearing gowns made out of bin bags, wearing ski masks or swimming goggles, because PPE of the required standard was not available. Healthcare professionals described feeling like lambs to the slaughter. The College regularly expressed its concerns in correspondence to the UK government, devolved administrations and other relevant bodies, including the HSE. Uh, however, one-size-fits-all protective equipment was a problem for frontline healthcare health workers who were obliged to work with this inadequate material up to 12 hours at a time. There were many brands that did not produce masks which fitted female faces, particularly with the shape and design of those masks being too big and causing many to fail the fit testing process. Nor did the masks meet the needs for an adequate fit for members of ethnic minority groups. Turning then to the question of fit testing. Problems with the lack of trained and available staff to fit test PPE resulted in staff being withdrawn from clinical care at the height of the pandemic to undertake the necessary training. Uh, nursing leaders reported being given up to 17 different types of masks within one trust, which meant that fit testing of all staff was repeatedly required. 
and some members reported that equipment needed to be needed to undertake the fit testing faced additional procurement and supply issues. Some members reported that equipment to undertake fit testing was not available to them, and the demands to fit check, not fit test, placed nursing and midwifery staff at risk due to issues with masks not providing an adequate facial seal. I'm sorry, Ms Morris, I'm going to have to ask you to... Uh, I've been tough on others, um, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to... I appreciate you've got some very important points to make, um, but I'm sure there are ways you can do it. Uh, Milady, uh, we do make it points um, in our written submissions concerning both airborne transition and its significance, uh, and also uh, the response of the IPC. And if I can just briefly deal with that. There was a serious lack of engagement from the UK IPC cell. Uh, and uh, the college's expectation was that stakeholders such as itself would be proactively engaged, especially given the seriousness of the situation in the development of guidance. But as the pandemic progressed, its professional correspondence and offers to support were ignored and offers to meet were turned down. The college expected that given the fundamental role of the nursing profession, the guidance-making bodies would want to engage with them. Nurses had unique expertise. This lack of engagement prevented the college from putting forward practical and clinical rationale for amendments to guidance. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there, Ms Morris. Thank I'm really you, sorry. Lady. It's just not fair on everybody else. Yeah. Mr Jacobs. My lady, these are the submissions of the Trades Union Congress. I'm instructed by Thompson Solicitors and I appear with Miss Ruby Peacock. My lady, a few of the submissions on behalf of those who represent healthcare workers have started with or featured direct accounts from workers. We have in common an awareness of the power and importance of the voice and experiences of those working across healthcare. Our own written submission opened with an account of an emergency medical technician in the ambulance service. She says, in the beginning, there was a lot of uncertainty. It was terrifying. I cried driving to and from work, mostly in fear of taking COVID home to my parents and child and the risk of leaving my son without his mum. There was little to no PPE. We were asked to use it sparingly. We were asked to reuse items. We were using out-of-date stock or given two single-use face masks for a 12-hour shift. The sights were harrowing, taking people from their homes, leaving loved ones behind, knowing they would never see them again. We lost colleagues and friends. That account, of course, will be familiar to so many who worked in our nation's health services. And indeed, it echoes the account of the paramedic in the impact film of yesterday. Healthcare workers on modest pay, resolutely continuing on at great personal risk in an, in an embattled health service so that at least some of those who needed it could receive healthcare. We owe them a debt of respect and gratitude, but also, my lady, of action. In these submissions, we focus on the impact of the pandemic response on workers, on the causes of that impact, and on the lessons to be learned. On impact, we welcome that the inquiry, having heard submissions from core participants, has decided to call and hear directly from a number of frontline workers. It is right and important that those voices, representing the many thousands who implemented the decisions made as to the provision of healthcare, should sit alongside the evidence of those who made them. We have heard from and do not repeat um, the observations of Ms Carey and others as to the death toll, the high rates of long COVID and the profound impact on mental health. Of course, the impact of the pandemic has extended far beyond its end. The scarring drip by drip effect of working in a stretched and underfunded service was compounded by the experiences of the pandemic and subsequently by the growth of waiting lists. Four years in and burnt out was a phrase from the impact film yesterday, and it rather encapsulates a damning truth as to what is faced by our healthcare staff. 
We have heard this morning about waiting lists approaching 8 million, close to double the figures prior to the pandemic and more than triple the figures in 2010. It is patients that face the acute dangers of waiting lists approaching 8 million, but it is the workers who sag under the weight of that burden in a system that gives them neither the means nor facilities to address it. As in an account to the TUC of an NHS podiatrist, our ulcer caseload has tripled since 2020 because of the lack of routine care. The pressures on other specialties means we are holding on to patients that we shouldn't be. Our role has changed significantly and the stress has continued to get worse, but we are told to get back to normal. As to the causes of that impact, they are myriad. They include significant deficiencies in planning and preparedness and resilience. As in your module one report, my lady, the NHS was running close to, if not beyond capacity in normal times. A root cause of many issues that this module will consider is the staffing of the NHS. Going into the pandemic, there were 106,000 vacancies across the NHS in England alone. As to the effect of that, I can do no better than endorse the powerful observations this morning on behalf of um, others, particularly the Royal College of Anaesthetists and the Royal College of Nursing. Another cause is the lack of effective health and safety regulation and enforcement. The HSC is the primary regulator for workplace health and safety, but its capacity is frustrated by drastically decreased funding. In the healthcare context specifically, the HSC continued to regard healthcare as an area for lower intervention. Healthcare received little attention in terms of proactive inspection, notwithstanding the glaring deficiencies in workplace safety and the grave risks faced by healthcare workers. The problem was compounded by underreporting of workplace deaths under the RIDOR regulations contributed to by the HSC's own guidance. In future, it is critical that the HSC should have both the mandate and capacity to respond dynamically to a crisis such as a pandemic and to increase its operations in the healthcare sector. Another cause was the familiar problem of inadequate PPE, and again, we agree with the observations made by others. It should be kept in mind that adequate PPE is necessary across the whole range of healthcare workers, including in roles that can sometimes be less visible. One NHS worker told the USC of the sorry told the TUC of the experience of intensive care being prioritised, but colleagues on other wards did not feel safe. They had little access to PPE and were told they did not need it. A portering supervisor told the TUC it felt like the porters didn't matter. When we were transporting COVID patients from wards and also to the mortuary, getting in lifts in enclosed spaces, no proper PPE was provided, just plastic aprons and gloves, but no proper masks. The disproportionate impact of the pandemic was exacerbated by the attempt, ultimately abandoned, to bring in a policy of mandatory vaccination. Despite clear warnings at the outset from unions and others, the UK government proceeded with the plans at great cost to workforce morale and the trust and confidence of black, Asian and minority ethnic healthcare workers. The dubious benefit of the policy, if any existed at all, was readily outweighed by the adverse effects on staffing levels and morale. Turning finally to lessons to be learned, we have had the welcome indication that the learning of practical lessons will form a focus of the substantive hearing. Within the scope of this short opening, we observe that recommendations are clearly needed in a number of areas, including in respect of resilience and surge capacity, the NHS workforce, infection and prevention and control, the general protection of the health and well-being of the workforce, including regulation and enforcement and the consistency and scope of partnership working between the Department of Health, the NHS and its workforce. One important area for recommendations will be the measures necessary to lessen the disproportionate impact on black, Asian and ethnic minority workers. At a recent collaborative event with the TUC, Unison and FEMHO, black, Asian and ethnic minority healthcare workers were invited to discuss their experiences of the pandemic 
and what needed to change. There were some key messages, my lady. That the NHS needs to move from simply recording discrimination and disproportionate impacts to removing it. That pre-existing health inequalities should be acknowledged but not used to conceal discrimination in the workplace or be used as a carpet with which to cover the lack of action. That migrant workers must be valued and protected rather than treated as dispensable. That there must be effective workplace safety of adequate and tailored PPE, of meaningful risk assessments, of effective monitoring and regulation that measures related to worker health and safety must extend in practice to outsourced parts of the workforce, which is disproportionately ethnic minority. Those key areas, and no doubt others, will serve to, to, to lessen the disproportionate impacts in future. My lady, those are our submissions. Thank you very much for your help, Mr. Jacobs, very grateful. Right, we should take the break now. I shall return at 25 too. My lady, Ms Jones and I appear on behalf of the Disability Charities Consortium, instructed by Alex Rook and Anne-Marie Irwin at Rook, Irwin, Sweeney, both specialist disabled people's rights lawyers. The DCC includes the Business Disability Forum, Leonard Cheshire, MENCAP, MIND, the National Autistic Society, the Royal National Institute of Blind People, the Royal National Institute for Deaf People, SCOPE and SENSE. My lady, as you know, the DCC is not publicly funded in this inquiry, which explains its somewhat restricted approach to participation. And whilst, of course, it will do all it can to assist, the lack of funding may to some extent increase the burden on the excellent CTI team to explore the issues of concern to disabled people. My lady, the UK has a proud history of enacting legislation to protect and promote the rights of disabled people, including the Disability Discrimination Act 1995, the ratification of the UN Covenant on the Rights of Disabled People and, of course, the Equality Act 2010. That includes the duty to make all reasonable adjustments to remove disadvantage relating to disability and to give due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination and advance equality of opportunity for disabled people, amongst others, when exercising public functions. Importantly, in relation to disabled people, these duties are anticipatory in nature. In other words, uh, public decision makers should not wait to be told of disadvantage, they must anticipate and address it in advance and indeed before policy is formulated. These positive obligations come together to create an obligation to create a level playing field for disabled people. However, unfortunately, prior to COVID-19, the UK standing as a leading exponent of disabled people's rights was already being systematically dismantled by the self-inflicted disaster that was fiscal austerity. Grave and systemic violations, the UN found in its special investigation, investigation in 2017, reflecting the insufficient incorporation and uneven implementation of the Convention across all policy areas. In the context of healthcare, this was also present underscored by the lack of preparedness and resilience in the NHS prior to COVID-19, and as is set out so comprehensively by, amongst others, the Bereaved Families for Justice UK. My lady, I briefly remind you and those listening of the disparate impact of COVID-19 on disabled people. Three in five COVID deaths experienced by one in five of the population. The hearing and visually impaired were 12 times more likely to die of COVID-19. The visually impaired, eight times more likely to die of COVID-19. The hearing impaired, four times. And the learning disabled, six times more likely to die of COVID-19. My lady, one can see immediately from these figures that clinical as opposed to social factors cannot possibly explain these massive disparities in mortality rates. These must also be seen alongside the disparate impact in terms of the COVID-19 restrictions on disabled people. My lady, even accounting for its multifaceted nature, 
it remains striking how little has been achieved in terms of understanding these disparate impacts and why they occurred. In the evidence before you in Module 3, the DCC can only highlight upon one paragraph of Sapana Agrawal's statement from the Cabinet Office, paragraph 8.57, where she seeks to uh, make some tentative observations about what the causes might have been of this disparate impact. It is therefore the DCC's position that one vital task for this inquiry is to ensure that this lack of understanding is remedied. In relation to that, we make three broad points. The first is that the disparate impact on disabled people is not explained by a lack of knowledge. The Department for Health and Social Care and NHS England stress the evolving nature of the knowledge during the pandemic and how a lack of knowledge explains why some decisions were that were made at the time may not have been made with the benefit of hindsight. But the government was aware of the adverse social impacts for disabled people as early as the 14th of May 2020 and the disparate impact in terms of mortality rates by the 19th of June 2020. And yet disability was not listed as a relevant disparity or risk factor in the Public Health, in Public Health England Review of Disparities published in June, uh, uh, June 4th, or indeed the subsequent iterations of that review that took place through the year. Indeed, the disparate impact was not properly considered until much later. The Equality Hub made detailed representations about that impact and its causes and potential remedies in the late autumn and winter of 2020. But even then, disappointingly, there was a surprising lack of action. The bulk of recommendations were not implemented by government at that time. I just highlight one example for the benefit of today's hearing. A recommendation to set up a national panel of disabled people was not implemented. No clear explanation for this is provided in the contemporaneous material or indeed the statements prepared for the benefit of this module. It's particularly regrettable because my lady, unlike many other uh, bodies like the Royal Colleges or the professional bodies and the trade unions, disabled people had no formal mechanism of being consulted or being involved in government decision making at the time. And indeed the purpose of the national panel was to improve the interventions by government so as to benefit disabled people and mitigate some of those adverse impacts. The second submission is that the adverse impact is not explained by hard decisions. Again, the Department and NHS England all stress that the exigencies of the situation and the gravity of the threat meant that difficult decisions had to be made. They are odds to stress that there were seldom right answers or good alternatives to what were hard decisions. It is emphasised that health inequalities existed before and therefore inevitably persisted during the pandemic. My lady, it is undoubtedly true that to some extent the disparate impacts were made worse by, for example, the state of the NHS and the capacity issues that existed pre-pandemic. But the DCC does not accept that A, the disproportionate impacts on disabled people were in some way inevitable, or B, merely by being aware of the disproportionate impacts at the time were sufficient to meet the positive obligations. Of course, the duty to inquire into the impact on disabled people is a vital prerequisite to the fulfillment of the anticipatory and public sector equality duties. But that alone can never be enough by itself. Hand-wringing, my lady, is no replacement for positive action. Indeed, there are hard-edged examples of how the difficulties of the situation did not explain or justify the impact on dis disabled people. But one example, why did it require the CEO of RNID to write to the Prime Minister in April 2020 to ask for the most basic of requirements to be met, namely that government communications should be in an accessible format? For example, why was there no BSL interpreter during government announcements, including the lockdown announcement itself? After that letter, some improvements were indeed made, but multiple errors persisted. And of course, my lady, you've already heard evidence and submissions about how similar basic errors were made in relation to communications for those who did not speak English as their first language. The third submission, my lady, is a query. Was defective decision-making to blame? The approach to equalities is described variously as being of high or great even personal concern to decision makers, including former secretaries of state. It was not treated as an add-on or an extra, but baked into decision making, we are told. 
The practice of engagement and consultation is stressed by, amongst others, again, the former Secretaries of State. But does this rhetoric not hide the truth that all too often the needs of disabled people in particular were indeed an afterthought, disadvantage only corrected, if at all, after interventions by, amongst others, DCC members, in direct contravention of the legal duties I mentioned? There are several seriously egregious examples. Government guidance, including the clinical frailty scale, seems to have led to the use of blanket DNR notices and the practice of denying care to certain groups of learning disabled people. Remarkably, in its written submissions, NHSE England highlights this issue as an example of flexibility and good practice, a story of success not echoed in the CQC's reports on the same issue. Mentioned by Ms Carey KC yesterday in her opening, persistent concerns were also raised on behalf of disabled people about the move to remote consultations in primary care. Jackie O'Sullivan from MENCAP highlights at paragraph 5 of her statement that these changes appear to have been introduced without any reference to an equality assessment at all. Visiting restrictions, my lady. Initially, no exceptions were made for those with mental health conditions, conditions that made them particularly susceptible to distress when isolated from friends or family, or those with physical ailments who needed the support of their carers whilst in hospital. The belated acknowledgement of such basic needs is completely inexplicable. Shielding and the CEV and CV criteria appears again to be made without apparent regard to the risk factors presented by adults and children with disabilities. The shielding policy was based on perceived clinical risks only. This medicalised model overlooked completely the well-known social and structural barriers to which disabled people were exposed. Indeed, people with learning disabilities and those living with Down syndrome were belatedly included in the SPL. But learning disabled adults were not added to the shielding patients list until the 19th of February 2021, despite evidence published in November 2020 that they were experiencing a disparate mortality rate. Similarly, with those living with Down syndrome, they were added in November 2020, but the disparate impact had been made aware to the government by June 2020. How are these gaps explained? Further still, the addition of those people to the SPL list was not properly communicated to those affected. Some people were not told they were on that list until January 2021 and the beginning of the rollout of the vaccine regime. My lady, these hugely significant decisions were made without proper equality impact assessments or consultation, compounding disadvantage for disabled people in clear breach of the positive duties upon government and other decision makers. It is notable that the approach to EIAs in particular was not consistent across the devolved nations. For example, the limited EAs done by Scotland in relation to shielding, etc., proved the point that breach was not inevitable or unavoidable. It was just negligent. Mr Burton, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to bring things to a close. I'm sorry. My lady, I have just two more points to make, if I may, very briefly. Um, we accept that these points are identified and to some extent um, acknowledged by NHS England, but they're not identified by the politicians themselves. And the final point really is this, my lady, that these failures do not, them do not of themselves necessarily explain the huge disparate impact on disabled people, but they do serve to create a justifiable suspicion that despite the rhetoric, because government was not properly and systematically addressing potential disability discrimination, many poor, more disabled people died or were negatively impacted by COVID-19 than ought to have been the case, leaving disabled people feeling expendable as if their lives were less valued. On any view, they were unseen, and they must not continue to be unseen by this inquiry. So they do have one overriding question, my lady. Why was a disabled person so much more likely to die of COVID-19 than a person who was not disabled. The DCC requests respectfully answers, accountability, and above all action. A repeat avoided at all costs. Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Mr. Mitchell. Good morning, my lady. Uh, these are the opening remarks on behalf of the Scottish Government. Uh, I appear today along with Mr. Way, uh, junior counsel, and we are instructed by Caroline Beatty and John McPhail of the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Just before you go on, can I just say for the um, subtitles, it's Mr Mitchell KC. <laughs> Sorry, Mr Mitchell, I just suddenly realised that for some reason our records don't have you down properly. Thank you. 
people are at the centre of our healthcare system. Uh, at no time in our recent past was this more apparent than during the COVID-19 pandemic. The contribution made by those working in healthcare, in social care, in the NHS, and in the voluntary and charity sector was immeasurable and critical to our passage through the pandemic. This was aided by the general public who supported the provision of healthcare. However, the suffering was great. On behalf of the Scottish Government, we convey our deep sympathies and condolences to the many thousands who have lost loved ones, who have suffered and who continue to suffer because of COVID-19. Of course, the Scottish Government is eager to take the opportunity presented by this module to learn from the evidence, to identify what could have been done better and to improve government decision making. In these opening remarks, we look briefly at the form of the healthcare system in Scotland, then at the structures within which decisions were taken, and finally at particular aspects of the response to COVID. Looking firstly then at the form of the healthcare system in Scotland, in 2004, the NHS trust structure in Scotland was removed by legislation. Its replacement was significantly different. It was not designed to create competition between health boards. Rather, it was designed to be a cohesive system that encourages and promotes collaboration and learning between the boards. In Scotland, healthcare is fully devolved. Policy is administered through the health and social care directorates of the Scottish Government and delivered through the boards. Prior to the pandemic, chief executives of the boards met regularly with senior civil servants from the directorates and with ministers. This meant that at the start of the pandemic, there was a strong working relationship and a familiar way of working already in place. This was useful when it came to dealing with the emergency situation that we all faced. Looking now at the structures within which healthcare decisions were taken, from the outset of the pandemic, the Scottish Government put in place policies, processes and operational frameworks to support the response. The Four Harms Framework was introduced early in the first phase of the pandemic. It formed a key part of the context within which strategic healthcare decisions were made. The framework identified four main categories of harm caused by COVID. Namely, one, the direct health impacts of COVID, two, non-COVID health harms, three, societal impacts, and four, economic impacts. One notable feature of the approach to decision-making during the early part of the pandemic was that, it, was that it prioritized the direct risk of COVID to health. This approach was refined when the framework was introduced. However, managing the, direct, managing the risk of direct health impacts of COVID remained a key focus for the Scottish Government when making decisions. The Scottish Government understood that the harms were interlinked and that no decisions were good or risk-free. However, the framework allowed for a freeing, for a weighing and balancing of risks, informed by increasing knowledge and experience of how to respond to the virus. Looking now at aspects of the response and firstly at the equalities and differential impact uh, of COVID-19. Equalities considerations were an important part of decision making. This is evident in decisions that were informed by an understanding of the differential impact of the virus on certain parts of the population. For example, the work of the expert reference group for COVID-19 and ethnicity has left a legacy that exists some three to four years after its inception. An understanding of the differential impact can also be seen in the policy and strategy behind the shielding list, known in Scotland from June 2021 as the highest risk list. The shielding programme aimed to reduce the risk of infection, severe illness and death. The four UK CMOs, working with other senior clinicians, identified certain health conditions that were likely to present a higher risk of negative outcomes for certain people if they contracted COVID-19. It was the clear and stated policy intent from that point onwards to identify, protect and support people considered to be at highest risk of severe illness or death from COVID. Shielding advice and guidance was given to those on the list and to the general public. The Scottish Government worked with pharmacies, with regional and local resil resilience partnerships and with multiple retailers to help people who were self-isolating to get access to food and to medicines that they could not get for themselves. The Scottish Government recognises that shielding was not easy. Mental and physical health was negatively affected 
many individuals try to follow the guidance to the best of their ability, but caring responsibilities and quality of life considerations made this very challenging at times. There are lessons to be learned around the support that is necessary to allow people to shield. It also raises questions around what is and what is not feasible in terms of shielding those at the highest risk. However, the principle of protecting those at high risk remains valid. Turning to prioritisation of care, decisions in this area were among the most difficult. There was an acute awareness that patients outside prioritised areas would have to wait for treatment in circumstances where their condition may deteriorate. The key focus was on emergency care, critical care, cancer care, maternity and mental health. The Scottish Government established a clinical prioritisation framework that set out six key principles that health boards followed when making decisions on elective care waiting lists. Patients were categorised into levels of clinically agreed urgency based on their particular clinical condition. This allowed health boards to prioritise those most in need. Looking now at infection prevention and control within healthcare settings, while the UK government and subsequently our High Scotland held and maintained IPC guidance for Scotland, the Scottish government nevertheless took a central role. It worked with health boards to ensure that appropriate IPC measures were in place in healthcare settings. It communicated updates and changes in IPC guidance. It worked with the boards to implement IPC measures such as appropriate use of PPE, extended use of face masks and face coverings, optimal ventilation, enhanced cleaning measures and testing for healthcare workers and patient admissions. In May of 2020, it set up the advisory COVID-19 nosocomial review group to understand better the healthcare-associated COVID-19 epidemiology and the emerging evidence. Coming, coming finally, my lady, to the impact on doctors, nurses and healthcare staff, the following very sad statistic must be acknowledged, that between 13th April 2020 and 20th July 2022, the Scottish Government was notified of 27 deaths of NHS Scotland staff caused by or suspected to be related to COVID-19. Responding to the unique challenges presented by the pandemic took a significant toll upon the entire health and social care workforce in Scotland. Understanding the toll was particularly important in order to ensure well-being and to identify opportunities to improve conditions. At the start of the pandemic, the Scottish Government established the Workforce Senior Leadership Group, which brought together senior representation from government, health and social care employers, trade unions and representative bodies. It met regularly to discuss and to provide strategic advice and guidance, taking on board real-time feedback from staff representatives. This partnership working led to, for example, the temporary adaptation of terms and conditions of service and, where appropriate, adaptation of policy, all to support NHS staff and services. Other measures were introduced to ease the burden on the workforce, including financial help and support and assistance for staff wellbeing and mental health. My Lady, in conclusion, there are other important topics that I could speak about today of in detail, but time simply does not allow. They include the 2021 NHS Recovery Plan for Scotland, PPE and the Scottish Government's commitment to tackling long COVID. These topics and others are covered in our written opening statement, which we would encourage those who are interested to read. But we finish these opening remarks where they began, with the people who helped to bring Scotland through the pandemic. On behalf of the Scottish Government, we would like to acknowledge the extraordinary contribution made by those working in healthcare, in social care, in the NHS and in the voluntary and charity sector in Scotland during the pandemic. Their professionalism, compassion and resilience in intensely challenging circumstances saved countless lives. The Scottish Government extends its thanks and gratitude to all those who kept healthcare services going during this period. My lady, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Mitchell. Uh, is it Mr Barry or Mr Bowie? Mr Bowie, my lady. I, um, have I asked you that before? I can't remember. I think you may have, but... <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, my lady. The following oral statement is made on behalf of Public Health Scotland, or PHS for short. 
I'd like to make some brief comments under the following three headings. PHS's role generally within the NHS in Scotland, PHS's specific role during the pandemic, and finally, PHS's interest in this module of the inquiry's work. PHS is Scotland's national public health body. It came into existence in December 2019, and it was created to strengthen national leadership in public health. The rationale was to establish a unified public health organisation with a focus on improving and protecting the health and well-being of Scotland's population, and no less importantly, reducing societal health inequalities. However, PHS is not involved in many of the practical aspects of maintaining public health at a community or local level, which are instead dealt with by public health teams within Scotland's 14 national territorial health boards. Scotland's 14 territorial health boards. Neither is PHS involved in regulation or inspection, nor is it involved in the development of infection and prevention control IPC guidance for healthcare settings, which is a matter for NHS NSS. Prior to the creation of PHS, the responsibility for protecting the Scottish public from infectious diseases and environmental hazards fell to other, another organisation, namely Health Protection Scotland, or HPS, which was a part of NHS NSS. When PHS became operational, elements of HBS transferred over to PHS. However, one element remained and still remains a part of NHS NSS, and that element is R High Scotland, or Antimicrobial Resistance and Healthcare Associated Infection Scotland, to give it its full title. And that name will feature significantly in this module. Unlike the other national NHS boards, PHS is distinct in that it is jointly accountable to and uniquely sponsored by both the Scottish Government and the Convention of local, Scottish Local Authorities, or COSLA. This reflects the fact that public health in Scotland is viewed as a shared endeavour of local and national government. My second heading, PHS's specific role during the pandemic. During the pandemic, PHS had a major role in both leading as well as contributing to Scotland's response across a range of areas. Its scientific knowledge and expertise were relied upon by Scottish Government and the organisation was widely viewed as a key source of data, information and advice. In particular, PHS supported the Scottish Government's modelling of future projections of the pandemic. PHS advised the Scottish Government on the development of its national testing strategy. PHS advised Scottish Government on the development and rollout of its test and protect programme. And finally, PHS shaped the digital infrastructure that supported the response. My third heading, PHS is in this particular module of the inquiry's work. PHS is particularly interested in how data and guidance played a role in the matters under consideration. On data, its use was particularly important in the response to the pandemic. PHS was the primary source for data and intelligence on the pandemic. Daily figures were produced on the number of tests conducted, the number of confirmed cases, the test positivity rate and mortality figures. PHS monitored and published information on COVID-19 hospital admissions using the Rapid Preliminary Inpatient Data, or RAPID tool. PHS carried out work to identify and report on discharges from NHS hospitals to care homes during the first wave of the pandemic. And the Scottish Intensive Care Society Audit Group, which became a part of PHS in April 2020, monitored and compared activities and outcomes in critical care units. Successful initiatives included the development of a range of effective data and analytic outputs that included robust estimates of the number of people with COVID in Scotland, hospitalisations and deaths. The PHS Daily Dashboard allowed the public, local authorities and Scottish Government to gain immediate access to COVID data in an accessible format. The EVE 2 project. PHS worked with the University of Edinburgh on a data reporting system called EVE2, which gathered vital intelligence about issues such as the spread of the disease, impact on health and vaccine effectiveness. And finally, PHS also worked with a number of universities on the REACT Scott case control study, which showed that along with older age and male sex, severe COVID-19 is strongly associated with past medical conditions across all age groups. On guidance, 
PHS was responsible for developing, publishing and reviewing a wide range of public health guidance throughout the pandemic. Responsibility for specific guidance on infection prevention and control remained with RHI, on whose behalf I will be speaking shortly. Finally, on public messaging, my lady, whilst pandemic messaging was led by the Scottish Government, PHS played an important supportive role, working closely with R High Scotland as well as local national NHS boards to ensure continuity of and congruence of public health messaging in tandem with Scottish Government direction. Public messaging in hospitals and other healthcare settings, however, was the responsibility of the local <coughs> NHS boards in Scotland. Finally, before I conclude, most importantly, my lady, PHS offers its sincere condolences to all those bereaved as a result of COVID. The organisation understands the enormous suffering of all those who have been affected and are still affected by the far-reaching effects of the pandemic and COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Mr. Pugh. Um, the Scottish uh, Health Boards uh, welcome these hearings into the impact of the pandemic on healthcare systems. They will allow uh, a full exploration of the relevant facts, including the response of the NHS in Scotland. This brief opening statement will be the first time the Scottish Health Boards uh, have uh, spoken public in this, publicly in this inquiry. Uh, and with that in mind, we have set out in writing uh, some of the details of uh, who uh, the group comprises. Put shortly, though, uh, my lady, it is the 14 territorial health boards that uh, serve the different geographic areas in Scotland, as we heard uh, yesterday morning, together with five of the special health boards that serve the whole of the Scottish uh, population. Lady, the ethos uh, behind this group's participation in this inquiry uh, and in, in this module and later modules is to assist the inquiry uh, and in doing so uh, to strive for both uh, learning and improvement. Uh, and through that participation uh, and with that ethos, the health boards hope to benefit the future health care of the Scottish population. At the outset of these uh, oral remarks, uh, Milady, the Scottish Health Boards recognise the deep wounds uh, felt uh, by those who have either lost loved ones or who continue to suffer physically and mentally as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Their sympathies and condolences are with uh, anyone so affected. On the 17th of March, uh, Milady, as you've already heard in Ms Carey's uh, opening address yesterday, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport said in a speech to the Scottish Parliament addressing the developing pandemic, the scale of the challenge is, as the First Minister has said, quite simply without precedent. To respond to COVID-19 requires a swift and radical change in the way our NHS does its work. It's nothing short of the most rapid reconfiguration of our health service in its 71-year history. From March 2020, the health boards uh, that I represent implemented key changes in practice and policy to create uh, significant uh, additional capacity for COVID-19 uh, patients and to manage infection prevention and control within the existing NHS estate. They had to do so uh, whilst uh, continuing emergency, uh, maternity, cancer services and urgent care all of which have been maintained uh, alongside many other services throughout the pandemic. We've summarised in writing some of the key changes and developments that were undertaken. And in the interest of time, I'll not read those out uh, th this morning. However, these key changes and developments, whilst easy to summarise in a paragraph or so, were far from straightforward for those in leadership roles to implement. Furthermore, none of them nor others too numerous to mention here, would have been possible without the extreme hard work and dedication of the employees of each of the health boards. Exceptional effort and skill were shown not only by those employed in frontline services, IPC and health protection roles, but also those who supported and enabled them from porters and cleaners through to laboratory staff and administrative personnel. Healthcare staff and managers found new ways of working and collaborating with colleagues and other agencies to ensure that overall the healthcare system has been able to respond uh, 
uh, to the very significant pressures of COVID-19. The Health Boards wish to take this opportunity publicly to thank uh, their employees. The extraordinary lengths to which uh, NHS staff went during the pandemic it has, of course, been rightly recognised by the public throughout the pandemic's course. Of course, my lady, uh, recognition of the hard work and dedication of those key workers must also acknowledge the sacrifices that they made. One only need recall stories of frontline staff being unable to return to loved ones at the end of shifts uh, for fear of infecting them to understand the extent of such sacrifice. And that sacrifice was, of course, shown uh, so powerfully in the opening impact film yesterday morning. The emotional, emotional and physical toll upon those caring for people dying without their family and friends around them was enormous. Healthcare staff were required to work under frequently changing uh, national guidance and to make challenging ethical and clinical decisions under extreme pressure and in unknown circumstances. They required to do so as colleagues became ill and in some cases tragically died due to the disease. Uh, the media images of those working in high-risk areas dressed fully in PPE caring for such seriously ill patients will live long in the collective memory. And in that regard, my lady, the, the early stages of the pandemic in particular saw difficulties in some areas, both determining and obtaining the correct PP. And that's, of course, a matter that this inquiry will look uh, at uh, in detail during the course of this module. The impact of the pandemic has been felt across the health service. It's affected countless patients' experiences of health care. Health boards have not yet recovered from the pandemic and uh, on current estimates are unlikely to do so for some time. The impact on patients caused by delayed diagnosis of certain conditions, combined with the emotional and psychological toll of the pandemic and its knock-on effects on services, is, under, is unlikely to be understood uh, for some time. Uh, and COVID-related conditions such as long COVID fall to be managed alongside the risk of new variants will again uh, require uh, surges in hospital care. We set out in writing how the health boards anticipate participating in this uh, part of the module, and again, I'll not repeat that. Uh, but put short, uh, my lady, the health board's commitment is to assist the inquiry in its, portent, in, in its important work. Participation is important to the health boards and will contributing to their learning and developments. Uh, and ultimately, it may be uh, for the health boards to implement uh, some of the recommendations that this inquiry makes in this module. And with that, uh, and they were required to do so, having regard to the resources available to them, uh, and are keen uh, to insist uh, the inquiry in making those recommendations workable. Thank you, my lady. Thank you very much, Mr. Pugh. Very grateful. Uh, Mr. Moore, you're up again. The oral statement is made on behalf of NHS National Services Scotland, or NHS NSS for short. I'm going to adopt the same headings as I did with PHS and consider, firstly, NHS NSS, NSS's role generally within the NHS in Scotland, secondly, its specific role during the pandemic, and thirdly, its particular interest in this module of the inquiry's work. NHS NSS was established to provide national strategic support services and expert advice to Scotland's NHS. Current services provided by NHS NSS are diverse, ranging from RHI Scotland, part of the wider directorate NHS Scotland Assure, to Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service and National Procurement and Logistics. Turning now to my second head, NHS NSS's specific role during the pandemic. Whilst not primarily a public-facing organisation, the services provided by NHS NSS had a role in the response to the COVID pandemic in Scotland. Specifically, its roles included programme management services, including the commissioning and decommissioning of the Louisa Jordan Hospital Test and Protect and COVID-19 vaccination programmes, procurement and logistics for personal protective equipment, operational delivery of the UK national and local testing programmes in Scotland, working with partner bodies and organisations to ensure access to appropriate COVID testing for the population, working with other bodies on the production of UK COVID infection prevention and control guidance, development, publication of Scottish COVID infection prevention and control guidance in October 2020, and finally, surveillance and monitoring of COVID in Scottish healthcare settings. NHS NSS played a significant operational role in the response to the pandemic in Scotland across a wide range of diverse functions. My third heading, NHS NSS's 
NSS's interest in this module of the inquiry's work. NHS NSS is particularly interested in the scrutiny of the development of IPC guidance during the pandemic. Our High Scotland played an important role in this area, and NHS NSS wishes to take the opportunity to clarify a number of points as to the proper role and remit of our High. Our High Scotland has the remit for the development of IPC guidance for Scotland. It's got no responsibility for the development of guidance out with Scotland. Prior to the COVID pandemic, Scotland was the only UK nation where the NHS produced and published a National Infection Prevention and Control Manual, or NIPCM. The NIPCM is a live document. As such, its evidence base is continuously reviewed through ongoing systematic literature reviews using a defined methodology supported by the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, or SIGN, in order to develop the guidance recommendations. The NIPCM Scotland literature reviews critically appraise existing guidelines produced by other international organisations in line with best international practice. COVID IPC guidance was published at the outset of the pandemic by Public Health England and applied in all four UK nations. The guidance was further developed using a range of intelligence undertaken by multiple organisations, including ARHI. Following the request of the Chief Nursing Officer in Scotland in October 2020, Scotland moved away from UK IPC guidance and through the NIPCM published a national COVID IPCM IPC addendum which formed the Scottish National Guidance. ARHI had weekly meetings with IPC stakeholders in Scotland where perspectives of health professionals regarding evidence from literature, local epidemiological reports and international organisations guidance and experience were considered and reflected on. This in part explains why Scotland moved away from the UK IPC guidance. And now I'd like to make some comments, if I may, about the COVID nosocomial review group in Scotland. In Scotland, the COVID nosocomial review group served as an advisory body that examined the epidemiological, scientific and technical concepts crucial for understanding the evolving COVID situation and its potential impacts on hospitals in Scotland alongside published evidence. The advisory group applied the advice coming from the WHO, SAGE, the UK-wide IPC guidance cell and other appropriate sources of evidence and information used it to inform the decision-making process in Scotland. RHI provided Scottish epidemiological and clinical data, which as well as supporting the development of guidance, informed the development of advice to Scottish Government via the Nosocomial Review Group. One key source of information provided by RI was the COVID cluster monitoring system, which collected varying levels of information on the number of patient and staff cases, hypotheses, investigations, and lessons learned. And this was a unique and important tool in Scotland, which offered insights into the burden of COVID clusters, the mechanisms of COVID introduction into healthcare settings, and the factors promoting its transmission. These reports enabled RHI to provide regular situational updates to stakeholders. RHI also provided epidemiological intelligence to the nosocomial review group via the onset COVID-19 surveillance system, the hospital onset COVID surveillance system. That system monitored trends in confirmed hospital onset COVID cases. As the system collected information for all COVID cases diagnosed in hospital inpatients, the burden of community cases on hospitals could be quantified. These data informed the development of patient testing strategies and supported the wider understanding of the severity of COVID. And finally, rapid reviews. Our High Scotland undertook rapid reviews, which were primarily focused on the assessment of SARS-CoV-2 virus studies that were published as the pandemic unfolded. Their purpose was to support NHS Scotland IPC and clinical staff who, without the rapid reviews, would have lacked a reliable source of intelligence to stay updated on emerging evidence. No other organisation in the UK attempted to provide such support for frontline IPC staff. From March 2020 to April 2022, monthly 
assessments of IPC measures for the prevention and management of COVID in health and care settings were conducted. Weekly meetings were held with Scottish infection control managers, IPC nurses and doctors, and Scottish Government to share intelligence and support implementation. The reviews didn't make graded recommendations, instead providing evidence summaries, and this was considered appropriate. To conclude, my lady, our High Scotland has invested significantly in national IPC resources and has a well-established collaborative network. This ensures and ensured that service providers and supporting organisations are integral in the development and implementation of national IPC guidance. Our High Scotland, we believe, is very well placed to give an account of the structures, governance and processes that existed regarding the development of IPC guidance during the pandemic in Scotland. The inquiry will be hearing from Laura Imrie, the clinical lead for Our High Scotland, in due course. Her evidence will be important, my lady, not least given the observations made in the opening statement on behalf of CATA, the content of which my lady will be familiar with. Our High Scotland does not shrink from the important issues that CATA raises. And finally, and importantly, NHS NSS, like PHS, offers its sincere condolences to all those bereaved as a result of COVID. The organisation understands the profound impact that the pandemic has had and continues to have on people and families everywhere. Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Mr. Bowie. Mr. Kinnear. Prinhan uh, good afternoon, my lady. The pandemic had far-reaching effects on healthcare services in Wales and on the people of Wales. Those effects are continuing, not least on waiting times for treatments. As was movingly demonstrated by yesterday's film, the inquiry will hear powerful evidence about people with COVID-19 who are treated in busy and overstretched wards and who are understandably frightened whilst they were in hospital. We will hear from family members who are unable to be with their loved ones as they died, from people who struggle to access NHS care and treatment for conditions other than COVID-19, and from those who continue to suffer uh, from the pandemic's long-term effects. We will also hear from frontline healthcare workers who, at great personal cost and risk, continue to provide care and treatment in the most challenging circumstances. These accounts will lie at the heart of this module they will cast an unflinching light on what worked and, crucially, what did not work. Their accounts will inform the measures that should be taken in responding to a future pandemic, and the Welsh Government is grateful to them for their courage in sharing them with us. We will also hear from those senior officials and ministers who were responsible for the Welsh Government's response to the pandemic. They will each give a full and frank account of their decisions and the circumstances in which they were made, the reasons for those decisions and how the Welsh Government's response developed and changed as development of the virus evolved. As in all previous modules, uh, the Welsh Government witnesses will fully cooperate with your work. May I briefly touch upon a few particular matters? The overall provision of NHS services in Wales is the responsibility of the Welsh Government. NHS services themselves are provided by health boards and NHS trusts. Each health board is responsible for providing services to its local population in its geographical area, and NHS trusts, together with two special health authorities in Wales, are responsible for providing certain national services. Operational decision-making rested with those NHS bodies responsible for day-to-day -day activities and the allocation of resources to ensure an efficient and effective service in their area. The Welsh Government is responsible for funding the NHS in Wales, setting the strategic direction and planning requirements to ensure funding is utilised efficiently whilst improving health. During the course of the pandemic, the Welsh Government revised planning arrangements to allow the NHS in Wales the flexibility to respond as effectively as it could to the emerging situation. As the experts concluded, visiting restrictions played an important role in preventing the spread of infections within hospitals. The decision to restrict visiting was not taken lightly. The Welsh Government was acutely aware it would be restricting the access of family and friends to their loved ones at the most difficult of times. It was for that reason that guidance issued by the Chief Nursing Officer made it clear 
that enabling people to say goodbye to their loved ones at the end of their lives was to be facilitated wherever possible. That said, the Welsh Government shares the inquiry's determination to see how the complex balancing of factors relevant to restrictions can be differently or indeed better achieved in the future. The Welsh Government also <coughs> recognises that pre-existing health inequalities within Wales were exacerbated during the pandemic, that there were those who struggled to access the care that they needed, and that the use of PPE, visitor restrictions, and the increased use of virtual communications caused difficulties for those who were visually or hearing impaired. To ensure that decisions were informed and in the best interests of the most vulnerable and the most affected in Wales, the Welsh Government consistently sought to take account of these individuals in its decision making, including setting up the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic COVID-19 Advisory Group and the COVID-19 Moral and Ethical Advisory Group uh, to advise ministers. The inquiry will consider how these groups' contributions uh, informed and improved decision making during the pandemic. The Welsh Government accepts the conclusion of Drs Northover and Evans that the preparedness and response capabilities of the UK's healthcare systems failed fully to consider mental health illness, and that failure necessarily affected the pandemic response and the provision of child and adolescent mental health services, CAMS, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic. The Welsh Government sought to mitigate that omission by a swift response once the pandemic struck. In Wales, CAM services were essential services, and a range of measures were put in place to support them. Overall, services remained open and accessible during the pandemic through adapted service models. The importance of mental health was also reflected in the appointment of a dedicated minister for mental, for mental health. On any view, my lady, the availability of critical care capacity is a highly complex question. As noted by Professor Summers, the UK as a whole entered the pandemic with a deficiency of critical care capacity. Although bed capacity limits were never breached in Wales, in certain hospitals there were times when capacity was so stretched that CritCon Level 3 was declared, and on one occasion they were close to declaring CritCon 4 because all capacity had been uh, exhausted. On those occasions there was still limited capacity in neighbouring health boards, and the system of mutual support allowed demand to be satisfied. As far as the government is aware, there were no incidents where a patient who was clinically appropriate to receive critical care was able to access a critical care bed in the relevant health board area, or at least from a neighbouring health board area. Despite the focus on infection prevention and control in Wales, the Welsh Government accepts that there were too many hospital-acquired infections and it has funded a national programme to investigate and learn from the cases of healthcare acquired COVID-19 infections. The statistical analysis cited by the experts showed that Wales had a significantly higher percentage of hospital onset cases uh, during the first wave of the pandemic compared to England and Scotland. Analysis from national surveillance data in Wales identified that adjusting for confounding factors there was no increased mortality for hospital-acquired cases compared to cases admitted with COVID-19 from the community. It is not known whether the lower level in England reflected diff differences in hospital admissions or testing over those peak months. Again, that difference will, I'm sure, be investigated in due course. The provision of appropriate and high-quality PPE was undoubtedly one of the most significant challenges in ensuring the safety and well-being of the health and social care workforce. The Welsh Government managed and monitored PPE stocks, and although at a national level there was always sufficient in Wales, the evidence from those on the front line shows that there were still instances where individuals or individual hospitals struggled to obtain sufficient or suitable PPE. Again, that is a matter which we uh, anticipate will be investigated in due course. Those individuals identified as being clinically vulnerable or extremely vulnerable to severe complications of COVID-19 were asked to endure the most stringent restrictions on their lives in an effort to keep them safe. The Welsh Government recognises that there were shortcomings in the process by which clinically vulnerable and extremely vulnerable individuals were identified. In particular, no formal equality impact assessment was carried out before the policy was introduced. 
the policy and its development would also have benefited from greater direct consultation with disabled people, an admission that was later rectified through engagement with Disability Wales from June 2020 onwards. The Welsh Government's impact of shielding on vulnerable individuals, the Integrated Impact Assessment, noted that the most significant impact of the shielding policy uh, was positive, with the creation of a robust system of governance that provided assurance that access to services and provision continued for those who were identified as extremely vulnerable or shielding. My lady, in conclusion, the Welsh Government's overarching objective was to protect the Welsh population and to save lives. To that end, it worked in partnership with stakeholders, frontline workers and the public to support the NHS in Wales to respond to the extreme challenges it faced, to protect it from being overwhelmed, to increase capacity should the worst case scenario materialise and to minimise transmission of the virus. The Welsh Government fully supports the need for this inquiry to identify lessons that can be learned and improvements that could be made to improve its healthcare response in any future pandemic. My lady, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kinnear. Uh, Ms Fenlon. My lady, I appear, led by Jeremy Hyam King's Council and instructed by Sarah Watt of Legal and Risk, on behalf of the group of Welsh health bodies, which comprises the majority of Welsh local health boards, and Belindra University NHS Trust, collectively responsible for primary and hospital care for the majority of the population in Wales. The group of Welsh health bodies has, through the various statements its constituent bodies have made, responded to all the inquiry's requests for information in a timely and detailed manner and has provided the inquiry with a substantial amount of information in a form which we hope has been focused, digestible and useful for the inquiry's purpose. The inquiry sought by Rule 9 request a large amount of granular detail in respect of a number of specific matters. In response to these requests, each constituent member of the group carried out extensive research and provided the specific data as requested in order that the inquiry should have as full a picture as possible of the detail on the ground in Wales and of the operational impacts of COVID on the healthcare systems in their respective areas. As a result of this work, the group now feel that the inquiry has before it a wealth of evidence which gives a substantial amount of data as to the specific impacts of the pandemic, as well as insights into lessons which might be learned for the future. The inquiry has also identified a spotlight hospital in Wales, Glanguilly Hospital. Professor Philip Clare, Interim Chief Executive of the Howell Dha University Health Board, has provided a detailed statement giving a full account of how Glanguilly Hospital responded to the pandemic. He highlights how staffing capacity, already a problem before the pandemic, was compounded by COVID-related sickness, but a recruitment drive commenced in March 2020 resulted in the creation of around 1,100 new staff. He explains how bed capacity was increased and in fact Glanguilly Hospital never reached the position where an ICU bed, if required, could not be found for a patient. He highlights an issue echoed in other statements from the group of Welsh health bodies, that the frequent changing of guidance, particularly during the pandemic onset, caused obvious practical problems but also staff confusion and anxiety. In similar vein to concerns identified by Valindra NHS Trust, he points to the fact that Public Health England guidance was usually announced on a Thursday, but Public Health Wales on the following afternoon. This led to difficulties in initial implementation. As to hospital infrastructure, he identifies what is a fairly common theme in the evidence from Wales and elsewhere that the buildings themselves gave rise to practical problems implementing infection prevention and control guidance, 
in particular poor ventilation. In similar vein to the reports of other university health boards, he reports that sourcing of PPE was not the problem that might have been anticipated. The health board procurement teams were able to procure equipment appropriately, and although there was considerable anxiety in relation to PPE stock, and supplies of face masks at one point reached critical levels at Glanguilly Hospital, supply was not an issue, and neither were there significant delays in obtaining equipment once ordered. This is not to say that there were not some practical difficulties. But overall, although there was considerable anxiety at the start of the pandemic, the hospital was able to work around any issues over PPE supply. As to visiting restrictions and the difficult balance that had to be struck, the overall view was that the hospital did its best and probably struck the right balance through specific arrangements supported with all necessary PPE. The group of Welsh health bodies note that many of the recommendations Professor Clare identifies chime with matters that other health boards have also identified, and while still very much provisional submissions, the group would endorse the following suggestions. Any future recommendations would need to look at the existing infrastructure of hospitals in parallel with future pandemic planning, and all modern hospitals should be designed with pandemics and serious infection outbreaks in mind with existing buildings being upgraded. Pandemic planning needs to develop resilience in staffing, medical equipment and supplies. And to that end, there should be sufficient PPE stock or local capacity to respond and supply such stock built into the system. The development of reusable PPE would change the landscape. The creation of a reserve workforce, both skilled and volunteer, would assist with staffing resilience. The importance of national coordination of the senior clinical voice across Wales to ensure rapid sharing of experience and learning cannot be underestimated. Drawing on the experience of COVID, have pre-prepared guidance developed that could be swiftly adapted, disseminated and implemented harness the learning from the rapid development of vaccines to be applied to future pandemics. Share the learning internationally on the best ways of maintaining the well-being of clinical professionals in a high-risk pandemic situation. And finally, the development of surge capacity, whether through field hospitals or otherwise, should be decided nationally and funded centrally. In conclusion, the inquiry will already be aware from the two statements from Ms Judith Paget in her capacity as the Chief Executive of NHS Wales, that a considerable amount of work has already been carried out in Wales in terms of seeking to learn lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. This is all part of a firm commitment on behalf of all health bodies in Wales to seek to continue to improve the services they provide for the benefit of patients and in the wider public interest. Like the Welsh Government, the group of Welsh health bodies will be watching the inquiry's progress closely to learn further lessons in order to continue this improvement. Thank you, my lady. Thank you very much indeed. Ms Gray. I'm afraid you're not switched on. Thank you. My Lady, I rise on behalf of NHS England. NHS England coordinates the provision of healthcare services in England and had the responsibility of leading the emergency response of the NHS to the pandemic within England. At the outset, NHS England wishes to acknowledge the death, pain and suffering and burnout experienced by so many in this country and worldwide because of the global pandemic. We know that despite the concerted efforts made to mitigate the pandemic's effects, many suffered greatly. CTI has outlined the numbers of deaths involving COVID in this country. And over the last day, we've heard justifiably hard-hitting reminders of suffering, including in relation to the continuing effects of the pandemic from participants representing patients and the public, expectant mothers and babies, for example, and staff such as migrant workers. We expect that the further impact evidence will be just as harrowing, and we are committed to listening and learning. But focusing on the impact of the pandemic first on healthcare staff, 
no patient care would have been possible without the sustained and dedicated efforts of NHS staff and contractors across the hospital, primary care and community sectors who worked under extraordinary pressures for very lengthy periods. For NHS staff, the pandemic has almost certainly been the most challenging and painful period of their working lives, with many courageous personal sacrifices made. NHS England wishes again to recognise the extraordinary efforts that NHS staff and wider personnel went to in the pandemic and its continued impact. Their dedication has been remembered in a variety of ways, including by the award of the George Cross by the late Queen. Now, every piece of evidence to this inquiry challenges us to learn lessons from what happened. NHS England sees this inquiry's exploration of events as critical to not just preparation for future pandemics, but also to improving patient care now. We share the inquiry's desire to learn from past mistakes, but also to learn, we hope, from achievements and what was done well. It now seems difficult to speak of successes when the dominant theme over the last two days has been one of the costs of the pandemic or of suffering. We were and are not deaf to the negative impacts of policies adopted, whether demands are on healthcare workers or on patients facing delayed or disrupted care. Nor do we say, particularly with the advantage of reflection and hindsight, that we always got the balance right. But there are things to learn from in relation to what we would repeat. We cannot, Milady, in this opening, address all aspects of NHS care, and the many issues to be examined have been outlined systematically by CTI yesterday, but we would like to make a few thematic points. First, when hearing evidence of what was done during the relevant period from January 2020 onwards, we asked the inquiry to bear in mind the resources that were available to the NHS and the external constraints, resources such as the ageing NHS estate, constraints on matters such as testing capacity. Many, including CTI, have addressed the issue of NHS resilience and its capacity. And important though those issues are, we're not going to repeat our written submissions about them now. But sometimes what was accomplished has to be measured against what was known and what was available. Of course, this doesn't mean that the issue of emergency planning and preparation should be overlooked. However, plans can only get you so far when hit with unprecedented demand. Secondly, we asked the inquiry to recognise the serious purpose for which all measures were adopted, ultimately to preserve life. This is not a tale of carelessness or improper motives, nor one of accepting a disproportionate income on different, sorry, a disproportionate impact on different people but one in which difficult choices have weighed very heavily on staff whose overriding concern and priority was always to save lives. Third, we ask the inquiry to have in mind at all times the fog of war, the context on the day at the time in which decisions were made by organisations such as NHS England and the many uncertainties, including about the virus and its properties. Even now, there remains an acknowledged need for further research on the virus. Fourth, we ask the inquiry to assess the alternatives, or to put it another way, the counterfactuals. Evidence of the harm caused by a measure that was adopted has to be balanced by an equally serious assessment of the anticipated harms of alternatives to understand the choices made. We referred in our written opening to a few examples of dilemmas faced, and many more will be explored. Yesterday, we heard strong and deeply felt accounts of harm from choices made affecting pregnant women, babies, and the rights of birthing partners. Yet the inquiry will also need to understand the experiences of, and the need to protect midwives, other staff, and patients in considering how the balance is best struck in future. Finally, we asked the inquiry to look at the process or systems that were involved in striking these balances, to focus on systems rather than personalities. Mm -hmm. Many witnesses giving evidence are often speaking not simply of their own judgments, but of the consensus reached by a group, a cell or a committee, and we submit that this should be recognised in questioning. Our experience of decision making in the pandemic was that it was highly collaborative, with extensive stakeholder consultation and involvement. Against that background, we're eager to know what systems would enable better decision making in future crises. I'd just like to say a few words on NHS England's perspective on decision-making and its evidence. 
We've just mentioned collaborative decision making, and we set out in our written opening how, as a national body and a leader of the NHS, we work with a wide range of organisations and stakeholders and have to respect their remits. We've heard that this may lead to concerns about a lack of clarity on who is accountable or failure to take responsibility. This inquiry is, of course, one form of accountability, and we know that it will consider and delineate responsibilities carefully. We welcome this. However, the NHS is large, and decisions frequently require both input and then action from a number of bodies. Overall, our experience was that this was a source of strength. It enabled the all-hands-on-deck approach, the loaning of staff to share expertise, and the formation of joint groups, such as the UK IPC cell, a Four Nations group. At times, this included supporting the development of guidance that was not NHS England's responsibility. Other groups, such as the Royal Colleges, did the same, and this was truly appreciated. Such cooperation not only helped the pandemic response to be agile, but was also a check against groupthink. In written evidence, we provided NHS England's perspective on policy guidance and systems, as well as high-level data or statistics. This NHS England perspective will often be summative or an overview, but may not always reflect the variety of local experiences witnessed in other parts of the NHS. For example, in relation to critical care, the inquiry will hear both of periods of intense local pressures on bed availability in one region or hospital and evidence of the overall system response to maintain capacity, increasing ICU beds, the opening of specialist beds outside of the U ICU, and many other measures. In seeking to hold in mind both of these perspectives, we are not seeking to advance a false or an over-optimistic narrative, but to reflect the complexity of the NHS response over the protracted length of the pandemic. When we talk about the national system's response, we're not denying the experience of individuals, and we absolutely acknowledge the heightened pressure that most that clinicians were asked to manage. I turn briefly to inequalities and the culture of the NHS. The pandemic is widely recognised as highlighting and exacerbating entrenched inequalities nationwide, including in the NHS workforce, where there are about 200 nationalities employed. People from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds make up over 20% of the NHS workforce, and we know that they suffered disproportionately in the pandemic. We've set out in our corporate witness statement what was done in response, such as the creation of the NHS Race Observatory in May 2020, but we know that there's much more to do. In particular, NHS England wishes to acknowledge the issues raised by the Frontline Migrant Healthcare Workers Group submission. This summer, the CEO of NHS England said unequivocally to those within the NHS who were afraid in the wake of the summer riots, you are welcome, you are a valued member of our community, and that community should look after you. That message resonates in the context of the pandemic too. We acknowledge that one area of looking after is ensuring that all staff, especially the most vulnerable, feel able to speak out about their experiences and contribute to learning. We're deeply sorry that there are NHS witnesses to this inquiry whose genuine fear of victimization as a result of giving evidence has required them to give evidence anonymously. NHS Freedom to Speak Up campaign aims to create workspaces where people feel safe to speak with confidence and in confidence, but we know that there is much more to be achieved to make workforces safe for everyone. My lady, in conclusion, we've set out in evidence how, although there were no perfect options and often no good ones, the NHS did its best to deliver a shared and coordinated response, to share learning rapidly, to maintain treatment and to avoid harm. NHS England was able to provide a national coordination and integration with local NHS providers in a way that was never done before, working alongside government but operationally focused and independent of the wider demands of being a Department of State. The inquiry's relevant period ends in June 2022. Over two years later, the NHS continues to face multiple challenges in recovering from the effects of the pandemic. The impact on its staff has been profound and the legacy of increased waiting times endure. We'd hope to see in this module an examination of issues which will further help recover, recovery 
and identify and embed lessons to assist in the management of any future crisis. Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Very great. Uh, Mr. Jory. <coughs> Uh, my lady, I make brief representations on behalf of the Independent Ambulance Association. I, together with Miss Jessica Tate, am instructed by Linda Barker of Duncan Lewis Solicitors. The IAA is a not-for-profit trade association and the preeminent voice for independent ambulance providers across the UK. The IAA has over 50 member organisations who collectively employ thousands of individuals. They provide a range of critical services supplementing the NHS in the UK. And these include non-emergency patient transport, 999 frontline responses, high dependency patient transfers, and mental health patient transportation. Approximately half of all NHS funded non-emergency patient transport is provided by independent ambulance providers. <clears throat> During the pandemic, the independent ambulance providers pivoted their services to assist in the transport of COVID patients to and from hospital and to care for COVID patients, often at considerable risk to themselves and their families. The contribution of IAA members undoubtedly mitigated the impact of COVID on the UK's health systems. The headline topics we wish to address at this stage include the following. Key worker recognition. As you've heard from many other CP groups here, the failure to grant immediate key worker status to our members had an immediate and practical impact on the ability of our members to provide an effective service alongside the NHS to support the COVID response. Next, the shortage of oxygen and other medical gases. During the pandemic, oxygen and oxygen cylinders were in extremely high demand in the UK and indeed globally. The main domestic oxygen supplier <coughs> was unable to meet the unprecedented demand for oxygen and it was evident there was insufficient medical gas production capacity in the UK. Independent ambulance organizations were unable to replenish stocks for existing cylinders, resulting in vehicles not being operational. There remains an ongoing reliance on, and therefore vulnerability to, offshore manufacturing of medical gas cylinders, particularly oxygen, with a lengthy lead time for new cylinders. Further, during the pandemic, normal open market supply chains were effectively usurped by the government in favour of managed provision through the NHS or local authority managed portals, but there were problems in accessing these portals, which in turn created delay, uncertainty and disruption to services. Unregulated ambulance providers there were significant problems regarding unregulated ambulance providers carrying out what should have been regulated activities. IAA members are required to adhere to strict Care Quality Commission guidance. These unregulated providers are not subject to the same rigour of CQC inspection or indeed accountability. They cannot provide the same level of professionalism and service, and this in turn puts patients and workers at risk. Some of the non-regulated providers were opportunistically advertising for staff in response to the COVID crisis, having circumvented the normal approvals process by being subcontracted by CQC at regulated providers. Mental health patients. The well-being of mental health patients is of particular concern. The availability of mental health beds during COVID was limited and this continues to be an issue. The lack of beds locally results in patients being taken by IA members on long journeys at short notice in order to receive appropriate care. The knock-on effect of this is a subsequent practical challenge for family and loved ones to visit and provide support. 
financial stability in the first two weeks of the COVID pandemic, NHS funded non-emergency patient transport journeys reduced from 100% to less than 40%. As independent operators relied heavily upon by the NHS, IAA members found their financial viability suddenly and significantly undermined. Uh, as with all the matters mentioned, we will make practical proposals for recommendations uh, from this inquiry to avoid such a problem in the future. Communication. One consistent concern highlighted by our members was the lack of a clear line of communication as the scale and impact of the pandemic developed. Non-emergency patient transport does not have a permanent national team providing oversight and leading the work. In our view, the establishment of a small but permanent national team with powers of oversight and delegation would bring consistency in approach to commissioning of services, whilst also providing uh, innovation, equality of access and ensuring value for money. And finally, a more strategic role for ambulance service NHS trusts. We invite the inquiry to consider a more strategic role for ambulance service NHS trusts in coordinating and deploying the available assets of independent ambulance providers. For example, during the pandemic, the London Ambulance Service NHS Trust, who do not themselves provide non-emergency patient transport, coordinated with NHS hospitals on the patient movements required in the London area and directed independent ambulance providers accordingly. This regional system of commissioning and coordination was more responsive and efficient than the pre-existing centralised system. Milady, we look forward to assisting this inquiry in identifying issues and providing practical suggestions for solutions based on our members' experience. Thank you very much, Mr Jory. Right, I think that completes the submissions on behalf of the core participants. We shall break now and we shall begin hearing evidence this afternoon at five to two. All rise.